disease of breast cancer and change things that can be changed. Breast cancer is by far the most common cancer in women worldwide, both in developed and developing countries. According to WHO, there are about 1.38 million new cases and 4,58,000 deaths from breast cancer each year. One of the most significant reasons for its fatality rate is a lack of awareness regarding it. Early detection of the disease remains the cornerstone of breast cancer control. When the disease is detected early and if adequate di diagnosis and treatment are available, there is a good chance that breast cancer can be cured. If detected late, however, curative treatment is often no longer an option. The month of October is considered the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. But breast cancer awareness is not just a month, as the popular slogan goes. It is a necessary conversation, which we aim to take forward through the medium of this webinar. Also, due to the current pandemic situation, the world is not able to focus on some other issues which have been prevalent since years, which formed, it further increases the need to talk about them. We seek to learn and help others learn more about the relatively untapped topic of breast cancer. Our aim is to explore more about its causes, symptoms, and treatment. Women generally hesitate to talk about breast cancer. Due to this, they do not come up with the symptoms they might be facing, and, and though they do not take the proper treatment. This increases the morbidity rate, and we fail to fight the disease, irrespective of one's gender. Our association with breast cancer awareness is not only limited to spreading awareness. It is a long journey, and this webinar is just a part of it. We will be conducting a set of programs to aware women around us to empower them to ha for having a conversation about it. It would include talking to them about the symptoms, causes, and ways to recover or when to go to a doctor. Not only women, but men's participation for the cause would rather increase the reach of awareness levels among people. To carry forward the idea of engaging with people, we have launched our own hashtag, hashtag let that pink in, through our social media campaign. We request you all to support the cause by promoting the hashtag. We have prepared a video to showcase the same. I would now request Devashish to please share the screen and play the video for all of us. Hey, I have something to tell and it's kind of an emergency. What I think, no. Actually, I've been diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm, but you're a boy and boys don't have breast cancer. Spoiler alert, we all have breast tissues. Look, I'm serious, okay? He looks kind of sus. What's with the what's up order attitude? I'm telling you something which is real and prevalent in society. You have to go to the awareness and you are choosing to ignore it. Okay. I understand boys have tissues but they are not big enough to have tumour. Are you even listening to me since then? Okay. It's all gibberish to me. It doesn't make sense. I guess I will have to get them here now. Pink October is a collaborated effort between NSS and gender champions for spreading awareness about breast cancer. But even if we could not, that should not stop us from spreading awareness about this to our mothers and sisters, or in fact to every other gender who is prone to this. Wow. Let that pink in. No, bro. Let that pink in. With this thought in mind, we would like to extend an invitation to Dr. Shilpa Khatri Babur, Professor and Director, Academic Excellence and Public Relations and Protocol of WIPS and faculty convener for NSS WIPs and Gender Champions to present the welcome address. Ma'am is a sociologist from Delhi School of Economics who has been imparting knowledge for the past 25 years. A strong believer of the critical pedagogy, she holds several national as well as international publications and works closely with NGOs as a crusader against drug abuse amongst the youth. Ma'am, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Prableen, and thank you, everybody. Um, I'm really humbled uh, by this introduction. I've always believed and said uh, my introduction is my students, and you make me so proud with this particular initiative. On behalf of Vivekananda Institute of Professional Studies, 
I extend a very pink welcome to all of you. Uh, we are very privileged to have amongst us highly promising trio of doctors, a profession uh, which has always been revered as God personified. So uh, I would first, uh, you know, want all of you to express our gratitude with folded hands, to all of them. Thank you very much, doctors, for being with us. The first one to go amongst the trio is uh, Dr. Vikas Talreja. We have a video by him, which is going to be followed by question answers somewhere around 545. Dr. Vikas Talreja is a postgraduate cardiology from John Hopkins University. Uh, he's the recipient of the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer Mentorship Award. Dr. Talreja is European Certified Medical Oncologist and is currently a consultant at the Specialist Department of Medical Oncology and Hematology at Regency Hospital, uh, Kanpur. So we welcome you, uh, Dr. Vikas Talreja. It's, it's a privilege to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing those lovely flowers. And we mean it from the bottom of our heart. Over to you, uh, Omisha. You are on mute, Vacha. So sorry. We now have an informative video from Dr. Vikas Del Reja. I would request Devashish to kindly share his screen and enlighten the audience with that video. A very good evening to everybody. Today we are discussing the breast cancer and the various aspects of the breast cancer. Uh, I myself is Dr. Vikas Del Reja. I am a DM medical oncologist. The medical oncologist is a cancer specialist who deals specially with uh, all forms of cancers and their medicines. So all forms of chemotherapies, targeted therapies and other form of uh, treatments of cancer are, uh, we are the specialist of that. Uh, and I was formerly employed at Tata Hospital and Safdarjung Hospital. Currently, I am employed at Regency Hospital, Kanpur. So, when we deal with the breast cancer, we need to know what are the various screening tools for the breast cancer diagnosis. How do we define as what is clinical breast examination, self-examination, mammography, ultrasonography, FNAC, cytology. And why is breast cancer that much importance? So as you could see, the yellow line that indicates the breast cancer has shown the maximum rise of the cases from being 1970, being 20.1 per 1 lakh females to 31.3 in 2000. Uh, the incidence has risen quite sharply. And similarly, one of the most common causes in Indian also, the most common cause of the cancer is the breast cancer. And it is the most common cancer in women worldwide. Most common cause of death from cancer among the women. More than three-fourths of these women in developing countries are diagnosed in advanced stage of disease. That is in a stage three or a four disease. And if these lesions are detected, most breast cancers can be effectively treated with good outcomes. In India, 1,44,937 women were newly detected with breast cancer in 2012, of which 70,218 women died. So for roughly every two women newly diagnosed with breast cancer, one dies of this disease. And that's a very sad prognosis. And that's why we need to see which women we need to screen. So all women between the ages of 40 to 60 years of age needs to be screened. All women identified with the breast mass that has previously not been clinically evaluated needs to be screened for the breast cancer. Women with high risk factors can be offered screening from age 30 years. So what are those high risk factors? There is no children or children after 30 years of age. The mother or sister had a breast cancer. There was history of prior breast cancer or there was history of breast biopsies inconclusive of which is an initiation of menses before 12 years of age. 
and an overweight status. And the screening has to be done every two years. So when we examine, we, we need to be very sensitive because it's a sensitive part of a woman. And therefore, we need to, first of all, talk her into an examination. We have to respect that the woman's sense of privacy is there and the woman is anxious. We have to assure that it is just for diagnosis purpose uh, and we are here to make her comfortable. Throughout the examination approach, we should be very gentle in our approach and should avoid any sudden and unexpected movements and perform each step gently and ask her if she's having any discomfort during any part of the examination. And we can also assess her by the facial expression she has. We always have to take into factor the cultural factors and deciding what clothing we have to remove or what clothing we have to keep for her. And we have to cover the non-examined breast with a clean sheet or a drape. These examinations should be performed in a clean, well-lit, private examination or a procedure room that has a source of clean water and we always, always insist that a female assistant should be available to accompany the woman when a male clinician is examining. One of the most common cancer, and that's why it tends to have a number of myths. So I would tend, in next couple of slides, I will tend to find out what's the myth associated with these cancers and what's the real fact. So most common myth is that the most breast cancers runs in the families while the reality is only 5 to 10% of them are the hereditary. There are basically 90% of them which are largely due to lifestyle and environmental factors. There is nothing you can do to lower the risk of the breast cancers and that's a myth because you can keep your lifestyle healthy, maintain a healthy weight, exercise regularly and if you are drinking, you should limit as per the social norms for the alcohol. Ill-fitted bras causes blood cancer and that's a one of the most uh, common spreaded myth. But there has been a numerous studies and there wasn't uh, any difference between women who are wearing bras and who aren't wearing any bras. Regular mammograms prevent breast cancers and that's also a commonly spreaded myth. But in reality, it is very the dose of the radiation in the mammography is too minuscule to cause a breast cancer. However, it is important and impedent to detect it early and therefore change the prognosis of the treatment. Sometimes many women say that they have small breasts, so there is no chance of getting them a breast cancer and it is immaterial what is the proportion of the breast. Breast cancer can occur to anybody and is not affected by it. Many women, women say to us that they are very young, they can't have a breast cancer and that again is a myth because many of the women, in fact 70% of them right now uh, under 40 are being diagnosed with the breast cancers. Men can't have a breast cancer is again a myth because 1 in 922 men have a lifetime risk of having a breast cancer. Alcohol is not linked to breast cancer is again a myth because increased use of alcohol causes increased incidences of breast cancer. And only with women with the family history of bre breast cancer are at risk. And that's again a risk. All women are at risk. The family history just increases the risk. So how do you we classify the stages of the breast cancer? So anything which is limited inside the breast is a stage one disease. Anything which is limited inside the breast and has spread to the nearby lymph nodes uh, these are the swellings in your axillas that's or the armpits that's the stage 2 when the tumor has spread to the superficial structures of the chest wall has involved internal mammary lymph node these are a series of the lymph nodes in between uh, your chest uh, that's the stage 3 and when the cancer has spread outside the confines of the breast and the chest it is known as a stage 4 disease. So the commonly involved sites are bone, liver, lungs and brain. And therefore, the 
Bucharest examination is a simple examination which has to be done monthly during the period of ovulation previously at the same time and is as simple as one, two, three. One, in front of the mirror. Two, while lying down. Three, while bathing. In front of the mirror, just check for and look of the breast. Feel for your breast. See any dimpling, size differences, nipple discharge. And inspect four ways. Arms at the sides, arm at overhead, firmly pressing on hips and bending forwards. While you lie down, lie on your back with a pillow under your right shoulder and your right hand under your head. With the four fingers of your left arm making small circular movements, just follow up and down pattern over the entire breast area, under the arms and up to the shoulder bone firm press, firmly pressing. Repeat same procedure using the right hand on the left breast and while bathing also with your arms raised, check your right breast with the left hand and flat fingers using the same method as in previously. Repeat similarly on the other breast that is the left breast with the right hand. What you have to look, you have to look for any lump. If you have to look for any pulled up nipple, you have to look for any dimpling. You have to look for any discharges. You have to look for any redness, rashes or skin changes. So the breast self-examination detects the majority of the breast cancer. It's the potentially life-saving monthly examination at the end of the menses. You can do it and you can detect it early and in an effective manner. You have to inspect for any skin changes, look for any redness, any visible lumps or bumps or a nipple crusting or a symmetry. You have to raise the arms up. You have to see that the breast should rise evenly and watch for any dimpling or retraction. And feel for the lumps by raising the arms, feeling with the opposite hand. It just feels like a marble in the bag of the rice. The best method is using the middle of the fingers. So fingertips Usually when you do, they tend to poke a lot and our fingertips are too sensitive. So everywhere we feel that those there are a number of marbles inside the sea. So all breasts are somewhat lumpy. And palm is also insensitive. So the middle portion of the fingers is just the right method of do it. So start at one place, press in while circling with your hands and feel for any thickening or the size of a marble and mold in small circles as demonstrated in this. Then move to another location. Work your way around the breast in a circular clockwise fashion using small circles of the hand as you go. Make sure that the entire breast is being felt. Also, never ever forget to for palpate or feel the tail of the breast. Since breast is not a perfectly round structure, the tail of the breast is actually a tail of the breast which is inside the axilla. That's the armpit. Make sure to feel any lump in that portion of the breast. Using the same circular motion, feel the armpit also. Feel for any breast lumps, lymph nodes. Normally, you can't feel any swelling there. It's just uh, if you feel anything, it's usually the lymph nodes which are about the size of a pencil eraser but longer and thinner. And always try to express a nipple discharge. So strip the drugs through the nipple. Normally, one or two drops of clear milky or green tinge solution excretions are common. But it should not be bloody or in large quantities squirting out or staining the inside of the brass. Check on the other side. Following the same maneuver, raise the arm above your head. Feel for any lumps or masses. And always, always, always have a professional breast examination annually. Basically, it involves the same maneuvers, asking the same questions, looking the same way. And what are the mammograms? Basically, they are usually routinely advocated between the ages of 40 to 50 years. And uh, over the age of 50 years, it should be done annually. For patients with the breast problems or a family history, you should ask for from your treating doctor. And if you find something in breast, please don't panic. Many of these lesions are just not cancerous. But don't decide it by yourself. Go to the physician, a qualified medical oncologist, and he could help you with the same thing. 
and why we it is important to meet them because when they are caught early in an early stages like a stage 0 and 1 you could see that people do survive 10 years out of that and if it is a stage 0 that's around 90% if it's a stage 1 around 80% of them but as you go in a second and third stage and a fourth stage the survival curve dips a lot and that's why it is very important to be very apprehensive about what you have inside your breast. So what are the guidelines for the cancer detection for the breast? The Americans usually recommend that if from 20 years, we, you do a self breast examination monthly. From 20 to 40, a physician examination every three years. From 40 plus, physician examination every one year. A 35 to 40 is the initial mammogram, 40 to 49 is a mammogram every one to two years and 50 plus is a mammogram every year. And why is that uh, the survival curves are now shrinking because we have a better surgical therapies, a better radiation therapies, a better diagnosis therapies and a better chemotherapies. So the chemotherapies, which we, I am specialist have undergone a paradigm change over the last few years. We have chemotherapies, we have targeted therapies, we have immunotherapies, we have hormone therapies, we have better supportive care, less of side effects and the, the in history when you used to say uh, the alopecia or hair loss used to be a common side effect with scalp cooling, it, it is becoming rarer and rarer. So look at these breasts. These are the typical examples of how uh, the skin dimpling, the lump should be filled out. And when you do these breast examination and you find something positive, just go and visit your doctors to have a complete set of examination. Usually what is recommended next when you feel a lump is the mammography, a sonography, a cytology, a biopsy, and then we depend upon the breast cancer, how it is at, at what stage it is being diagnosed. So what are the risk factors for the breast cancer? First being a female, second being age, third being any family history of or a first degree relative having a breast cancer and ovarian cancer, menstrual history and a uh, 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 Childbirth more than 30 years is again a factor. And long-term hormone therapy for uh, postmenopausal women again increases the risk of the breast cancers. And oral contraceptives again have a slight increased risk of breast cancers. And a prior radiation therapy exposure also increases the risk of the breast cancer at young age. Obesity, diet rich in fats, alcohol again is a factor. There are BRCA1 and BRCA2 or commonly known as BRCA are the mutations which are commonly expressed in the breast cancers. And how do you assess the breast cancer risk? It's basically you look out at these factors, age being the first, age more than 35 years, the first degree relative with the breast cancer, any prior breast biopsies, age at MINAC, age at first child bug, and ethnicity. And that's how you give a scoring. When you have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, you have a relative risk of 10 is to 32 times of being diagnosed with a breast cancer. With a family history of cancer that is first degree relative, two times, two first degree relatives, three times, three or more first degree relatives, four times, and a first second degree relatives around one to 1.5 times. Any radiation to the chest wall gives a risk of 7 to 17 times. Hormonal factors, that is either late parity, of, that is a late first childbirth or a no childbirth, again 1.2 to 1.7. An early age minarchy, that is less than 12 years, you start your menses, or a late menopause, that is more than 55 years, again, you have a chances of breast cancer of 1.2 to 1.3 times the normal population. A combined hormone replacement therapy, again, 1.5 is the risk factor. And alcohol consumption, again, is a risk factor. Smoking, again, is a risk factor. Sedentary lifestyle, again, is a risk factor. Right race is, again, a risk factor. A breast, a very dense breast, again, is a risk factor. 
and what influences the survival, the age at which it is being diagnosed, the stage at which it is being diagnosed, the size uh, where the tumor is be, uh, being diagnosed, and what are the hormonal factors, the hormonal receptor, or it's a her to new uh, status about it is. You have to look for the masses. You have to look for any micro calcification. As you can see, these specks of calcifications or the speculated appearance on mammography, as you could see from these. And therefore, we have the classification of it. As I showed in the diagram, that's usually expressed in the T and M classification. T being the tumor size, N being the nodal status, and M being the metastatic sites. And I discussed what was the staging of these breast cancers and what is usually the treatment for a stage early stage cancer you have to remove that cancer you have to then examine it periodically after the removal for uh, dcis that is ductal carcinoma in situ which are hormone sensitive we give a hormonal therapy for five years for um, after the breast conservation surgery, which is usually practiced, which is as good as uh, removing the whole breast in an early stage of the breast cancer, we have to give some chemotherapies and followed by radiation therapies and followed by hormonal therapies for those who are hormone sensitive. For those who are uh, stage three, uh, you have to do the surgery, either the lumpectomy or the removal of the whole breast followed by chemotherapy followed by radiation followed by hormonal therapy if they're sensitive for stage four there is a whole paradigm of uh, therapy that has come uh, which, which includes but the primary management involves the chemotherapy and the hormonal therapy and a targeted therapy depending upon the status what could be the complications of the surgery usually 10 to 30 uh, 30 percent of the patients who undergo an axillary dissection or a sentinel lymph node biopsy tend to have that lymphedema, that is the swelling of the arms. There is usually numbness, there is reduced shoulder mobility, the psychosocial problems of mastectomy, and always a phantom breast sensations. Radiation reduces the risk of recurrence, may improve the survival. And there are various methods of giving a radiation. Either you give the whole breast radiation or you give a partial breast radiation. And the underlying treatment always involves a systemic therapy, which includes the chemotherapies, hormonal therapies, targeted therapies, and a lot, whole lot of changes. And the chemotherapies have involved a lot during the last frequent years. We have numerous chemotherapies options, numerous hormonal therapies options, numerous oral therapies options, numerous targeted therapies options, numerous immunotherapy options, and all of them have shown a survival benefit over the past few years. So although breast cancer incidence has been increasing, the mortality rates due to breast cancer are reducing. Advances in the conventional therapy, including the less radical surgery and reduced radiation fields, the cytotoxic chemotherapy has evolved a paradigm change over the last few years, including the types, the doses, and the scheduling. We have hormonal therapies, targeted therapies, immunotherapies, and the treatment now is an individualized chemotherapy, a selective uh, therapy for a selective patient. And that is the end of my talk. I am ready to take any questions if, if there are any. Thank you, Devashish. Uh, that was indeed in informative. And I now request all the questions in background of Dr. Talreja's video to be put up in the chat box for Dr. Talreja's immediate reference. Uh, uh, who, who will now be joining uh, us on 540, at 5.45 for Q&A. We are now honored to have Dr. Rachna Rohadgi with us. I would like to request Dr. Shilpa Khatri Babbar to kindly welcome her. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Omisha. Uh, a very warm welcome, uh, Dr. Rachna. Dr. Rachna has uh, done her MBBS from MAMSI, her post-graduation diploma and diplomate of National Board in Gynecology uh, from St. Stephen's Hospital. She has delivered several lectures and written for journals of international and national repute. 
she's always insisted on the significance of self care to all my gender champions here you would be glad to know that she is almost always quoted in discussions and write ups on role of gender ideology and work life balance uh, i know dr rachna rahotki uh, less as a doctor but more as a beautiful human being whom we always bother on our alumni batch group and thank you so much rachna for taking out time for all the participants and uh, especially my young budding children who want to put society before self over to you rachna thank you so thank much you. am i audible first and uh, visible to all of you first let us check that yes yeah so good evening everyone uh, i'm dr rachna rohatki as shilpa has uh, you know introduced me i'm an obstetrician and uh, gynecologist i would like to thank the organizing committee of webs for giving me this opportunity i would also like uh, to congratulate the student body of it for their enthusiastic participation i've been seeing the facebook and the uh, role plays and a uh, lot of write ups on there so i think you all are well read people and we want to make this session very interactive i don't want it to be a monologue that i keep on uh, you know burdening you with lot of stuff on breast cancer so uh, i'll be asking you questions you have to please don't unmute and just uh, write everything on the chat box and secondly um, we might you know uh, we i will be demonstrating how uh, breast self examination is done so in that case you will have to if you feel uh, nice you can open up your videos and we, you can practice it with me so today uh, i'll be discussing uh, breast cancer mainly i'll be highlighting uh, the high risk uh, factors uh what are the you know the clinical symptoms or the warning signs and the screening part at the end of the talk i'll be happy to take your questions and uh, so let's start with the discussion first children what do you understand by breast cancer uh has anybody read it up and uh, you can just uh, write it in your chat box what do you really understand by breast cancer let's start with the basics you know like uh, it's important so in simple language a breast cancer is a disease in which the cells of the breast grow out of control next i will be telling you about the anatomy of the breast now the breast you should know it consists of lobules lobules are the tract uh, milk producing glands and the lobules are connected by tubular things like uh, called the ducts which open into the nipple we have the connective tissue which is the fibrous and the fatty tissue and the nipples and the areola so this is the basic uh, you know the structure of the breast because if i am discussing the breast cancer you should all know what is the you know what is the breast cancer and how does a normal breast in a very simple language looks like now uh, can we start sharing the slides now i think uh, yeah now we can move to the uh, you know the next slide please yes now uh, let us discuss what's the burden of breast cancer in india according to the national cancer registry program released by the icmr one in 29 females is a patient of breast cancer next slide please why should there be breast cancer awareness now this is a very relevant question why are we you know holding these uh, breast awareness programs well, where is the need of this there is uh, an increasing uh, number of cases of breast cancer especially amongst the younger age group women amongst 30s and 40s it is one of the most common cancer in india uh, in females followed by the cervical cancer in india especially we are having a lesser survival rate in breast cancer as compared to the us the five year survival is uh, you know around uh, 60% now uh, what are the reasons for it reasons are mainly the lack of awareness and we are not uh, you know taking up the screening methods 
so it's very very important at this stage when the cases are rising and we have the younger populations um, so uh, we need to be aware of it next slide please Here, I would also like to mention that breast cancer, though we always talk in females, is just not limited to females. It affects both men and females. So men too have breast cancer. Though the incidence is comparatively uh, less, around 1% of the diagnosed male uh, breast cancer are in the world are male breast cancers. But unfortunately, the, uh, you know, the mortality of the breast cancer is pretty high. It's around 19% higher than the diagnosed uh, woman. So it's very, very important. That's the rationale behind the breast cancer awareness programs. Also, we so we are dedicating the whole month of October, which is called the Pink October, you know, to uh, create awareness at different levels about this cancer. Now, can anyone tell me what is this uh, pink ribbon stands for? Uh, we are putting up in all the slides and all the uh, programs. Can anyone tell me? Are you using your chat box? Any all of, any one of you? Actually, I am not unable to see that. Do we have any answers from the audience? No, ma'am, not yet. Okay, so I presume that nobody knows what this pink ribbon stands for and we are putting it up everywhere, right? So that the pink ribbon is an international symbol for breast cancer awareness. And the bearer of it shows that it is supporting the cause of breast cancer. This is very important to understand what we are doing in the month of October, why we are calling it pink October and what does this you know, pink ribbon uh, really stands for. Now, uh, I would uh, ask another question. Have you all heard about Angelina Jolie? Oscar winning uh, Hollywood actress. So um, I think this should impress the students of WIPS and uh, what uh, is she really famous for? And uh, why am I really mentioning her in this awareness program? Can anyone uh, really tell me? Anyone, I mean like the faculty or anyone, I would love to hear someone, you know, interact here and tell me what is so, uh, you know, famous about this uh, Hollywood actress. Shilpa? Yeah, so we have a reply from the student. So uh, there is Supreme. Yeah, when I speak of Angelina Jolie, I do expect an answer now. Yeah. <laughs> Ma'am, we just got a reply from Supreet Kaur. She's and saying that she is a breast cancer survivor. No, no, no. No, no. That's not correct, Beta. That's really not correct. Any more answers? Well, what is so famous about Angelina Jolie? So let me tell you now. You know, she found oh, there out. is another answer. Um, sorry, yes. uh, yeah, Rachna. Huh? Oh, couple of more. So come on, Shambhavi, okay, go let's ahead. See, let's see. Ab uno ne Google kar liya hoga, I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, you know, children are very smart these days, but let us see. Now, one answer was wrong. Now, let us see. Another answer is from Divyam Sharma that she went through mastectomy to prevent cancer. Yeah, that's, uh, that's quite close. Actually, she found out through genetic testing that she is, uh, she is at high risk for breast cancer because of her family history. And so ultimately she decided to undergo prophylactic. Prophylactic means preventive, means uh, uh, before the disease is diagnosed, bilateral mastectomy to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer. So, uh, you know, uh, this is the, you know, the, in spite of being the Hollywood heroine and, you know, breast are the basic assets. And so still she, you know, uh, underwent uh, this uh, procedure. So this is a very inspiring uh, thing. So I brought it up here. And I think uh, though there are many uh, real life heroes and uh, which we fail to mention, but yes, all the cancer survivors and who have been taking a lot of steps to you know, uh, prevent this disease and create awareness, they all appreciate it. You know. So uh, now I'll be discussing the high risk factors. Several high risk factors have been uh, of breast cancer have been documented. I think in the previous lecture I was uh, listening, uh, there was a battery of lists. I will be, you know, dealing with very uh, specific ones. First is the family history of breast or the ovarian cancer. 
there are some mutations in the BRCA gene, one on two. And what do you understand the BRCA? That's the breast cancer gene, okay? This, these results, the, these mutations give rise to the cancer. They're, they are very much prone to the cancer. But now when I say this, it's not, uh, please do not panic that I have a family history, now I'm going to develop a cancer. So it's not uh, you know, generally very true. But yes, there lies, the, if you have a family history, you should undergo genetic counseling and undergo genetic testing of these two genes, BRCA genes. So this is one important thing which I want to highlight in very simple ways. Next is the reproductive factors associated with prolonged exposure to estrogens. Early menarche, you attain your periods early, a late menopause, late age at first childbirth. So these uh, you know, lead to more estrogen exposure and these are certain reproductive factors which are associated with breast cancer. Breastfeeding uh, you know, uh, is said to be protective for breast cancer and uh, those women who are not uh, breastfed, they are generally said to be having a higher risk of uh, you know, uh, breast cancer. Certain exogenous hormone intake, like you know, oral contraceptive pills, uh, generally the you know, uh, hormone therapy uh, users, HRT, which you know, after menopause, if you are aware, certain women go in for these you know, uh, HRT. So they are at higher risk especially uh, with the oral contraceptive pills, uh, there's about 10% increased risk for less than five years of use. So current users, and they are more uh, prone to this cancer. A personal history of breast cancer. If you had a breast cancer before, you are more prone to develop it again. So, and now the main important thing which I would like to discuss is the lifestyle related, uh, you know, breast cancer risk factors, which are obviously considered to be modifiable breast cancer, uh, modifiable risk factors. So these are alcohol overuse, abuse, or, uh, you know, the obesity, physical inactivity. So these are the, uh, you know, lifestyle. So we are seeing breast cancer more in the urban areas as compared to the rural areas, the disease of the, you know, westernization and the urban uh, you know, areas. And here comes the importance of lifestyle modifications. And which is very important to, you know, to engrave in the, you know, right from the, you know, the beginning uh, for the students to know that, you know, they, it's important to eat a healthy, nutritious diet, good and fruits and vegetables. And then they should, uh, you know, exercising daily and check their weights and obviously, uh, con consumption of alcohol should be in a limit. Now, uh, I would like to discuss, you know, the risk factors in the male breast cancer, because we should talk uh, in both ways, not only about the females. So uh, a male breast cancer generally, uh, you know, develops as a lump in the nipple and the areola region. It also is associated with the breast cancer, generally it is associated with the breast cancer uh, gene two and with the prostate cancers. And uh, the other risk factors associated with male breast cancers are generally exposure to estrogens when the people are taking hormone therapy for prostate cancers or any other cancer, they develop this uh, male breast cancer. Though it's very rare as compared to the female breast cancer, then uh, certain chromosomal problems, like Klinefelter's, they're an extra X chromosome, if you're aware of the X and the Y chromosome. So these Klinefelter or the chromosomal anomalies can also lead to this male breast cancer. Certain, uh, you know, liver disease, like uh, cirrhosis of the liver, testicular disease, or the surgeries of the testis, they're also predisposed to male breast cancer. So these are the, you know, briefly I have put up the risk factors, which are very important and uh, which you should know. Now I will be discussing the clinical uh, presentations. You know, uh, what are the warning signs and when you should really go to a doctor. That's important for all of you to know 
if you have, uh, you know, what alarming signs that you should, you know, consult your doctor. For that, first, we need to understand one basic thing, a breast undergoes normal changes during the onset of puberty, during pregnancies, which we all know, during, you know, menopause, they shrink and they atrophy of the breast. And uh, during any weight change, if, if you gain weight, you lose weight. And even during the menstrual cycle, there's a lot of breast tenderness and other things. So these are the normal uh, physiological changes. So uh, certain changes in the breasts are normal. Okay. Now, what is uh, what is the warning signs of the breast cancer when you should alert? Be alert that this is something you know different, and I should really now consult a doctor. First important thing is a change in the size or change in the shape of the breast. It can be one breast or two breasts. So change in the size or the shape of the breast. Another important thing is you feel a lump in the breast area or the armpit, which generally persists. Most of the lumps, you know, they are, you know, after the menstrual, menstrual cycle, after you finish your periods, they just disappear, but they will persist. Very important changes in the nipples. That's very, very important to note. The nipples turn inwards. This is the, we call the nipple indentation or the nipple retraction. They will be, uh, you know, abnormal nipple discharge. Uh, the nipples uh, will be, you know, uh, the discharge from the nipple can be bloody or clear. It will be a very different kind of uh, discharge. And you can feel nipple pain, pain in your nipples, soreness, itchiness. Sometimes, you know, uh, breast uh, cancer is also associated with breast pain, but it's not a very specific uh, feature. Next important thing is from the nipple changes in the nipple, is the changes in the skin of the breast. That's very important. The skin generally appears red, swollen. It might be red, it might be swollen, or there can be skin dimpling, which we call characteristic and orange peel, uh, you know, appearance. That's very, very important, that orange peel kind of appearance. We can have swollen lymph nodes. You know, all of you might be aware that, uh, you know, the breast cancer, uh, you know, spreads to the lymph or the blood, okay? So sometimes the breast cancer can spread to the lymph nodes and under the armpit, in the, your armpit area or the near the collarbone, you might feel a lump. So it's not necessary that you are feeling a lump only in the region of the breast. So the surrounding area is also very, very important. So if you have any other, if you have any of these symptoms, it's a good idea to go fix an appointment with your doctor and, uh, uh, you know, consult and uh, go for testing and other things. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Yeah, these are, this is the, you know, uh, very simple representation of all the, you know, signs and uh, the symptoms. Uh, now I'll be, uh, you know, talking about the screening of the How do we, you know, what are the modalities available for screening of the breast cancer? Now, can we have the screening slide here? Yeah. So generally, uh, for the screening of the breast cancer, we have modalities like breast self-examination, a clinical breast examination, which is done by the doctor. And we have mammography, which is a gold standard. And this is the one basic thing which we should uh, know. And uh, the breast ultrasound. These are the basic, uh, you know, screening tools available to us. We will, uh, you know, let us all learn how to do a breast self-examination because that's the most important thing uh, that, you know, we can do at our levels, you know. So uh, before, you know, what do you understand all of you by breast self-examination? Can anyone, uh, you know, write it in the chat box, ki ye breast self-examination? What is this uh, breast self-examination? What do you understand? Have you ever done it? Have you started doing it? Are there any answers here? Is there any answer? Better you need to, uh, okay, so Supreet is there. Hmm. Uh, Ma'am, we just got a reply from Supreet Kaur that it's a way of examining any changes in our breasts. 
so yeah it is basically a visual inspection and the palpation of the breast tissue and it is done in the sitting and the lying position so my uh, request uh, to all of you is probably you can you know uh, you know practice the postures at least with me so that it gets uh, you know engraved in your minds and if the, some of the students are enthusiastic enough they can you know uh, you know put on their videos and show it will be a nice demo also so uh, before i start with the breast self examination i would like to tell you what is the extent of the breast and how does a normal breast feel so this is very important to understand can we have the uh, breast self examination slide please step 1 yes so uh, now the normal breast extends horizontally from the edge of the sternum does everyone know what sternum is it is a flat bone which we feel in the center of our chest now everyone uh, should you know palpate what is sternum you know and uh, you know make it sure that you know what sternum is and to the mid axillary line now what is this mid axillary line this is in the center of the axilla or the underarm your underarm area the center of the line so this is the horizontal spread the center of the breast bone okay uh, of the chest bone to the uh, uh, line passing through your underarm this is the horizontal spread now from vertically it extends from the collarbone please feel your collarbone all of you so that everyone is sure where if you remember what exactly to look into and it extends to the uh, upper crease below the just where the breast is so this is the area which you uh, can should consider while doing a breast self examination now my second uh, thing which i want to tell you practically is what does a normal breast feel if you do not know what is the feel of a normal breast so it will be very difficult for you to find out uh, what is uh, abnormal so the whole purpose of this explanation goes waste a normal uh, breast uh, feels uh, soft and it has a dovey uh, like consistency you know dovey like feel and with pads of the hand now what are the pads of the hand can you see these pads you know the these are the pads of the hands you generally feel it as lumpy grainy or pebbly kind of thing so these this is a normal uh, feel of the breast and this is and i have talked about what is the extent okay so now uh, why are we doing this uh, you know breast self examination what is the purpose of doing this the main purpose of doing a breast self examination is to get familiar with your breast and when uh, you know if you are doing it regularly you will get familiar with your breast and you can pick up any kind of abnormality so uh, it is that's the purpose of doing it now the thing is when should we start doing the breast self examination and what is the good time because most people are not aware of it you know i think uh, we are saying that uh, after the age of 20 it's a good time that we start examining our breast becoming breast aware so that is very very important and uh, it should ideally not be done very frequently we should do it on a particular day of the month and generally that should be few days after your periods have stopped you are finished because during your periods the breasts are very tender so the whole purpose of doing the breast self examination is defeated so you please do it uh, schedule it on a fixed date when your periods are generally uh, you know over so that would be a good time to do it and uh, now another thing which i want you to note here is very very important is that breast self examination does not uh, you know replace the clinical breast examination or a mammogram so this is very very important to understand that breast self examination is something which we are doing to be aware of our breast and we can actually if we find any problems we can go to our doctor but in no way it is now uh, you know uh, replacing the importance of clinical breast examination and a mammogram so this should be a very important thing which should be clear to everyone now let us start with the steps of breast self examination uh, we have tried to put up some slides but yes you can practice it with me 
at least you can uh, you know the postures in which you should be doing that would be good so now in the step 1 you look at your breast in the mirror arms by the side or on the hips you have to check for the usual things which i have discussed uh, you know in the you know clinical features the various changes in the skin lump and the nipples that all those features you have to see so this is the first position you have to stand in front of the mirror and uh, your hands can be either on your side or by the side of your hips so this is step 1 hope i am clear and i can move to step 2 because this is something which i want to teach you uh, before i you know end my lecture so is this clear can we move to step 2 now yes ma'am yeah so in step 2 now you put your hands behind your head like this and check the appearance again so this is step 2 now uh, i hope this is clear or need to repeat it this is very clear so here in step 1 and step 2 basically you are inspecting the breast you are standing in front of the mirror and you are just uh, you know you are in front it is hands are on the sides or by the hips and in the second they are behind your head like this and you are examining your breast now the step 3 this is done in the lying down position okay now uh, you can lie comfortably on the bed uh, on your back right arm should be up please see the figure here right arm up okay and the pillow should be behind the right shoulder if you are examining the right breast so just remember this rule if you are examining the right breast then the right arm should be up okay and the pillow should be below below the Uh, right shoulder and with the left hand so it's opposite you know like if you're using the right hand i mean the if you want to examine the right breast you have to use your left hand you have to now feel the entire breast and the surrounding area and you have to feel for the similar things like if there is any uh, lump or thickening or any different kind of uh, tissue with it so i hope the step 3 uh, is absolutely clear to all of you that this is done in the lying down position and uh basically uh, you know you are palpating you know you are feeling your breast in this step so is this very clear can we move ahead uh, to the step 4 yes ma'am yeah if you want me to repeat anything uh, because this is something which is not clear to most of uh, you know females and they are always uh, wondering how we should do because many people are telling you should examine your breast but how we should do it step 4 is in the standing or the sitting position okay you can either stand or you can sit on a chair and some uh, you know females find it easier to do uh, while they, they are taking a shower or with the lotion because then the breasts are slippery slippery and they can easily you know feel it so in this also we are you know examining our uh, breast feeling them for any kind of abnormality you are now recording all your observations and me and mark the calendar for the next week. this is how this is the you know the basic uh, uh, steps so do i need to repeat these steps or we can move ahead ma'am we can move ahead okay now what uh, sh uh, should be the pressure the pressure they we should apply pressure it should be firm but gentle this is important to note first it should be a very superficial you know soft kind of a pressure to feel under your skin then a slightly a medium kind of a pressure where you can feel the uh, deeper tissue the third pressure which you should apply should be a very firm pressure where you can feel uh, the breast bone and the ribs so you have to feel because breast cancer sometimes is very deep seated and especially if you have dense breast you might miss out so this is the you know the pressure too and uh, can i have that pattern slide please follow the pattern you know you have to follow a pattern so they can be you know you can choose any pattern which you are you know uh, familiar or you're comfortable with like you can go uh, start with the nipples and go circling out outside or you can do an up and down rows or you can divide the entire breast into sections and feel it your finger should all the time be moving in tiny circles so i think this uh, with this i complete my breast self examination and i hope uh, we should take uh, from certain of your students if they have followed it if there is anything they want me to repeat here 
I'm I would be very happy to repeat if they have not followed any step or they want me to you know uh, probably repeat it. Can we have some answers from the audience? Students feel free uh, all together. Yes. Your so, it will uh, be kept. This is something you're going to practice. You know. Because uh, uh, what is the purpose of telling you a uh, lot of big things? But when uh, what you can do, you know, that is something I want to discuss and make clear. So, uh, students, if there, if these things are not, uh, you know, any of the step, have you followed? Uh, is there any response? So, it is a request to all the attendees. If anything is not clear, kindly raise your hand or put it up. Yeah. So they say that it's absolutely. It's clear. very clear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, we will uh, move to the you know gold standard of screening that is the mammogram. So can we have the mammogram slide, please? Yes. Now uh, mammography is now the considered to be a gold standard for the screening. We are offering mammograms right from the age of forty, and we are doing annual screening. It is what is mammography? Most of the people, you know, I have put up a picture so you can basically understand how it is done. You know, the, how the machine is and other things. It is a low uh, dose X-ray test. So basically, it's an X-ray technique test. Okay, and uh, you know, the breast tissue is put on the ultrasound machine and it is, uh, you know, gently but you know, firmly pressed between the plates. You know, you can you see these plates? Is it uh, you know? Can you understand this? These are the places where plates where the breast is uh, you know compressed, and then we are taking the films. This is how is the you know the basic uh, procedure for it because I I've seen most of my patients don't even know how what is a mammogram, how it is done. Um, next slide, please. Okay, now uh, mammogram uh, is a very simple OPD procedure. It has high sensitivity and specificity. What are the basic instructions, you know, uh, which uh, a patient should be clear because they have many doubts ki when we should go for a mammogram and uh, what we should do before a mammogram. Uh, so it should ideally, you know, the patient should uh, go when uh, you know a week after their periods have settled this is for the screening mammogram please uh, mark it this is for a screening mammogram if you have any problems you've distracted the lump you should go immediately and as a what your doctor advises you you should follow that work for the screening then it should be ideally you should not be applying a lot of lotions talcums and other things because they appear as uh, you know calcium spots so these are, and if you are pregnant, then obviously you should not take up this test because it involves radiation. And uh, now I would like to say, what are the, you know, uh, not so good about mammograms? We always talk, it's a very good uh, screening technique, but at the same time, we should know what is not so good about mammograms. It is associated with false positivity. Five to 15% is the false positivity. So sometimes, you know, uh, they, it can create some panic. It can pick up some, uh, you know, very innocent lumps and then the patient has to be uh, followed up with a lot of, you know, mammograms and sometimes even they are subjected to biopsy. So this is one thing, you know, because uh, if we are doing a lot of tests, so this is something, you know, one of the not so good part about mammogram. And secondly, a small uh, radiation, you know, now, another thing is what myths, you know, most of the patients, they come up with, if they are doing so much of uh, mammograms each year, so uh, what radiation effects it can have. So let me clear it out here that, uh, you know, uh, mammography has a very low, uh, screening mammography has a very low radiation exposure. So the, uh, you know, the benefits which we reap out of detecting early stage breast cancer is much higher than you know, the small radiation dose we get. So all the females who are above 40 should, uh, you know, go to the doctor, should take up this clinical breast examination and a mammogram. Now, uh, in this slide, we are seeing how an ultrasound, uh, you know, clinical, uh, you know, breast ultrasound, how we are using this. So now in dense breast, sometimes the breasts are dense. So mammogram is, uh, you know, the sensitivity and the specificity falls 
uh, you know it is not uh, very good in cases of dense breast so what we are doing is we are uh, you know doing both uh, with the help of a radiologist we are actually doing both we are doing uh, you know ultrasound breast and the mammogram both of them are done and on base of the things we are deciding uh, and giving a final report so uh, both uh, sometimes both ultrasound breast and a mammogram is offered to the patient next slide please now i would summarize you know by saying a very important uh, you know take home message for all of you is knowing it exists is not enough so we should get it formed and pass it on so this is the whole uh, concept you know behind the breast screening procedure and uh, next slide please this is a very uh, you know my favorite quote of benjamin franklin an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure so this is very important for all of us to understand that we all need to be aware of our breast we should you know do breast self examination we should maintain a healthy lifestyle and go to a doctor as uh, early as possible if you pick up something so i think uh, this is uh, you know uh, i wind up my lecture here and i now be very happy to take your questions and and i hope now we will have a better interaction from the audience thank you devishish you can now stop the sharing yes thank Screen you so sharing. much devishish uh, for sharing the slides and i'll be happy to take your questions uh, yes do so, have yeah. both the questions uh, rachna these students have been insistent on uh, showing their gratitude for your highly uh, enlightening lecture so uh, yes uh, so you wanted to show a thank you screen to ma'am with i'm told flowers falling on her please go ahead oh oh thank you so much <laughs> that means a lot this really means a lot and i should tell you shilpa your students are you know i have interacted with two of them yesterday and uh, they are so enthusiastic and uh, you know so uh, you know ready to help and all those things and uh, you know you are blessed to have the students because you know these days uh, and they are you know uh, uh, what best thing is that they are participating for this and they are very curious to know and get aware so this is one good thing thank you so much this was uh, we are blessed to have a mentor like her <laughs> okay you. can we stop uh, sharing that screen please indeed yeah i am blessed to have them there is no doubt about it uh, i would like to inform the audience that we have i know a lot of questions for ma'am and we also have questions for uh, dr vikas who had to due to some emergency uh, leave so i'm i'm knowing rachna without even seeking her permission i'm sure she'll be able to take out time for those questions so could we yeah, have yeah. a question answer round please yes okay. please go ahead i'll uh, try to do justice with all your questions so uh, let's start yes yes please ma'am first question we have is Please what is the yourself. first introduce yourself i would like to know your name ma'am myself umisha kathuri i'm the moderator for for this webinar oh wonderful wonderful beta now yes please beta start with your question yes so the first question we have is what is the meaning of dense breast beta dense that breast question, sorry uh, rachna if if they don't mind uh, ma'am would love to know who has asked that question and uh, we are in the institute of professional studies okay. yes uh, so i would uh, appreciate you know to know uh, you know like this i uh, who is asking the question so you know it is good to know people uh, you know and um, actually the username is viveka in the institute of professional studies sir. yeah so dense breast is you know some uh, you know uh, ladies uh, i have mentioned in my lecture what is uh, you know some ladies have dense breast when we are screening it with mammography or with ultrasound sometimes the breast density is very high so it is very difficult to uh, you know pick up a lump there so in those cases we are you know uh, doing both uh, the mammography and the ultrasound so the breast density which we see you know uh, that is uh, high 
so that is the you know meaning of a dense breast it does not mean a big breast or something like that yeah thank you ma'am yeah, so the next question we have is from supreet kaur she is yeah. asking that to what extent does the surgery for treating breast cancer affect the mammary glands of a patient see that would depend uh, surveet right supreet? yes supreet 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 yeah she has been very active she you know answered most of my questions so supreet beta uh, basically that would depend on the type of surgery you know how much uh, you know uh, effect is going to have on the breast tissue sometimes when we are now uh, detecting the cancer early let's say in the uh, you know stage 1 we are offering them even just the removal of the lump you know and we are preserving uh, the breast so in that case the damage to the mammary glands will be less you know and sometimes we are you know doing just a simple uh, mastectomy we are just removing one breast and sometimes when they are coming in the advanced cases like stage 3 stage 4 we are doing a radical mastectomy we are removing all the breast and we are in, uh, removing even the lymph nodes and the underlying muscles and all that so uh, it all depends on the type of the surgery and uh, more uh, you know uh, that's important uh, you know that if we detect the cancer early you know so we can offer them more options more breast conserving surgeries and we can you know uh, you know uh, preserve the whole uh, uh, you know composition and the structure of the breast to as much as possible because anyway if you are doing a surgery removing the breast tissue is going to affect the mammary glands and it also affects the breastfeeding if the mother is lactating so i hope i have answered yeah i hope supreet that very well answers your question we now move forward to namrita singhal's question she asks she is asking that is there any possible association between the breast implantation and breast cancer see a uh, breast implants uh, you know uh, they might uh, you know have a small incidence of increase in the breast cancer but generally the latest kind of which we are putting in they are not uh, you know very much predisposing to breast cancer they might increase to a certain extent your breast cancer incidence especially if you have other risk factors associated with it uh the now another question is from shikha shrishti she is asking that can mothers feed after surgery okay this is shikha shrishti hello beta now uh, the thing is uh, once the patient has delivered and undergone a uh, breast cancer surgery so it will entirely depend uh, you know if the patient wants to feed she should first discuss it with her you know oncologist and doctor whether she can breast most of the times when the patient is undergoing breast cancer surgery like mastectomies and other thing we are in advanced cases we are offering them certain chemotherapy certain hormone therapy and they are secreted in the breast milk so it will not be a good idea for breastfeeding and then the doctor will say that this is not good uh, for the breastfeeding mother and she can probably you know stop the breastfeeding uh, for some time till these harmful things are you know Uh, till the chemotherapy dose is uh, uh, you know finished but uh, yes uh, if uh, you know breast surgery has been done and uh, now the patient is not undergoing any kind of uh, you know adjuvant therapy like or post op therapies like radiation or chemotherapy she can breastfeed and obviously the you know if both the breasts are removed and no breast tissue is there so she obviously cannot breastfeed if this is possible only when you know there is a you know simple uh, one breast has been removed and the other breast is there so she can feed from that breast or only a lump is if you remove the entire tissue then the uh, point of you know breastfeeding does not hold so first of all uh, she should have a breast tissue which is you know uh, where she can feed and secondly she should not be on any uh, you know harmful uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy or other kind of things which are secreted in the breast milk and it can harm the child and uh, obviously before surgery also sometimes we are saying that we should not be breastfeeding because sometimes breastfeeding can you know uh, increase the blood blood flow and increase the chances of infection so even before the surgery we are stopping this uh, breastfeeding but anyway there should be a discussion with your doctor 
next question please ma'am once the breasts are removed and i have heard of reconstruction of breast as well so can a female breastfeed after reconstruction of her breast no 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 i mean uh, uh, you know that's an artificial procedure where we are you know reconstructing the breast is mostly cosmetic and all uh, but generally uh, and there's lot of damage to the breast you know with the radiation and the thing also that's a difficult aspect you know okay thank you ma'am another question is from mrs hani bhartia she is asking that we have often seen that cancer reoccurs within 5 years in case of breast cancer how much chances of reoccurrences are there see uh, that will uh, you know uh, they cannot be you know the a specific incidence uh, percentage can be quoted to it that uh, and we cannot fix up a time also ki 5 saal mein hi aa raha hai ya 2 saal mein hi aa raha hai so sometimes you know it uh, once uh, the cancer one up once a person has a cancer and she has been treated so how good the surgery has been whether we have successfully removed the whole uh, tissue and whether we have successfully removed all the surrounding areas and uh, and uh, you know how uh, consistently uh, how go good the surgery has been so the recurrence chances is quite less but yes a uh, person is definitely prone to a recurrence and uh, it should be kept in mind it's one of the high risk factors thank you ma'am also another question is from anshi mudgal she is asking that is there any uh, yeah that's the same question is from shambhavi sharma we, are, we have another question is at the time of pregnancy if a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer what should be the way forward for her are there any complications related to well being of the child and what are the related repercussions also who asked this question can i shambhavi sharma Sh shambhavi sharma okay hello shambhavi so this is a good question and uh, thankfully it is related to my field also so uh, see if a person is uh, you know if a lady is diagnosed with breast cancer in pregnancy it is a uh, you know definitely high risk pregnancy and a lot of support is needed to the mother uh, you know in the first trimester generally the time of the surgery if it is uh, you know is uh, good uh, if you have to operate it is a good time in the second and the third trimester in the first trimester you know uh, you know we uh, uh, try to generally avoid any kind of radiation or any kind of uh, you know chemotherapy because uh, you know the organogenesis is, is taking place the fetus is being formed we do not want to subject them uh, to any kind of these harmful things which might affect the you know um, development of the baby so sometimes if you know if uh, the lady is just unfortunately detected with an advanced uh, breast cancer in the you know in in the initial 3 uh, months of the pregnancy and she has to be operated and put on a chemotherapy and radiation we sometimes even have to you know counsel her for termination of pregnancy and in the second and the third trimester are obviously good time for uh, you know uh, for operating the lady in when we have lot of time uh, before the patient uh, delivers you know second trimester something generally we we'll try to do you know uh you know uh, uh, we try to do a complete mastectomy and try to you know avoid the breast conserving surgeries because you know breast conserving surgeries are often we have to follow them with uh, some kind of adjunct like chemotherapy and other things by and uh, by far in pregnancy chemotherapy is safer we use certain uh, you know safer uh, chemotherapeutic agents like vaccine cyclophosphamide doxycycline etc etc and uh, so safer uh, chemotherapeutic agents are used and uh, in the uh, you know uh, once uh, the patient if we are detecting at the time when she is just about to deliver we can give her the options of breast conserving surgeries and probably once she delivers we can uh, give her the chemo or radio or whatever the oncologist uh, you know, feels and obviously in the first uh, this has a you know a lot of impact on both the uh, fetus and the mother and lot of reassurance and support has to be given to the mother so hope i have answered and if there is anything further she wants to know i would be happy to answer we can move to the next question yes shambhavi you can add on if it is not clear i yes. think that is <laughs> thank you ma'am moving mm -hmm. to another question uh, 
Yes, yes. It is from Mrs. Tehzeeb Fatima. How long should a lump be there before it should become a concern and requires a visit to a doctor? And are all lumps dangerous? All lump dangerous. Hello, Tazib. It was wonderful. First of all, uh, it was wonderful associating with you, and you really helped me with all my queries. Uh, so, okay. Um, now, the answer to your question is that see, all lumps are not, uh, you know, cancers. I may mentioned it, you know, in my lecture. So please do not panic. I have got a lump now. It's a cancer, and now everything is gone. You know, just eight out of ten uh, lumps which we detect can be cancerous. Mostly, you know, most of the lumps go off uh, by our menstrual cycles. You know, once we finish our periods, if you feel a breast lump and we just, you know, uh, to get off with our periods and uh, a week or later, if you, you know, generally, if you're not feeling them again and they're not persisting, so the, then we can just, uh, you know, be watchful. But yes, if they are persisting and with they are associated with any other kind of features, which I mentioned like you know changes in the skin or in the nipples or uh, you know so you should uh, not you know uh, contacting your doc uh, doctor so have i answered this um, or is there anything yes ma'am thank you so much yeah welcome welcome good to see you actually and we also got a reply from shambhavi sharma who is saying that thank you so much ma'am it's absolutely clear Okay, uh, uh, most welcome, Beta. Now, uh, are there any more questions, ma'am? Yeah, this is this will be the last question I'll be entertaining. No, no, uh, I'm happy to answer. No worries. Uh, I mean, <laughs> okay, interact because you know, if the uh, lecture is a monologue, it does not interest me. I'm so, and I am happy to answer as many questions. So please go ahead. We are grateful, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, so up next is from Yukta Mahajan. She's asking that. If someone is diagnosed with breast cancer, then how should one go about with the treatment procedure and what are the possible expenses? Okay. Uh, hello, Yukta. So, you know, this uh, uh, question entirely depends on when you are getting your breast cancer detected. In which stage or which grade you are in when you are, uh, and what's the exact spread of the breast cancer? So the cost and the type of the surgery will depend on that. Generally, if the breast is uh, detected early, let's say in stage one, we are offering them breast conserving surgeries like only the lump is removed, which we call lumpectomy or quadrant is removed, a simple mastectomy is offered. But yes, if it is, uh, you know, uh, detected late, you know, we are, uh, you know, going, we have to do a radical mastectomy, we have to remove the entire breast, the lymph node dissection has to be done. And uh, we have to, you know, uh, uh, give uh, even the radio, chemo and all those things. And depending on that, the whole expense, uh, you know, is and obviously it is a very uh, economic burden on the family, apart from the emotional uh, and the psychological effects. So the uh, cost is uh, definitely depending on the surgeries and the state you're going to uh, you know, be detected. I hope that answers your question, Yukta. Uh, Omisha, since uh, Dr. Samir has joined us, but there's one last question from a, from a boy and I, I don't want to disrespect that. Yes, Can you yes, take yes, up yes, that yes, question, yes, please? please. Uh, of all, yes, I'm very sure. consistently following everyone and uh, generally I've not seen the boys interacting though I have, you know, really told them that it is very important for men to be aware and, uh, you know. So uh, here we finally have a boy with a question. Yes, so, yes. No, so that should not be this. This is from Ishan Budhiraja. In men, only obese men with male breasts are prone to breast cancer or anyone in general can be diagnosed with it. So what's his name? Ishank. Ishank. Ishank Budiraja, hello. And uh, I really appreciate your, you know, uh, inquisitiveness on this matter. So first of all, I'd like to clarify, it's not that only one person who is developing male breast, uh, male breast cancer has male breast. So all men have a breast issue and it is a male breast. Uh, Every man has it. Like all females have breast, uh, so all men also have breast. But uh, the tissue is, you know, uh, comparative not so developed in men and uh, it's uh, obesity is one of the factors 
in both uh, you know males and females but uh, it cannot be said that on all obese men will have cancers there are you know lot of risk factors uh, which uh, like i have discussed in my uh, lecture like estrogen therapies and the uh, uh, chromosomal um, aberrations like planfelter syndrome and sometimes uh, so all these factors are you know uh, sometimes and uh, importantly sometimes we do not have any high risk factors and still a person unfortunately develops a male breast cancer so everyone has a male breast and uh, i hope yes, i answered yeah it. that very well answers his question i think Uh, also yukta mahajan is also thanking you ma'am yeah most welcome most welcome so i i take over from here thank you so much rachna it's been almost one hour and i think i'm sure umisha joins me in tazeeb that we actually did not even come to know that it, it's almost one hour till the time indeed the doctor sir yeah, started to show in like and uh, so uh before uh, we welcome uh, dr samir uh, i would like to introduce vivekananda institute of professional studies uh, to both of you dr rachna and dr samir and and we just hope that uh, the emergency for which dr vikas had to rush it goes uh, fares well and we are with the patient uh, vivekananda institute of professional studies was uh, laid in uh, 2000 as a part of uh, strength india society uh, which is uh, basically standing for acronyms s t r e n g t h uh, uh, signifying society for the revival of national glory and true heritage under the founder chairman uh, dr s c watts we are affiliated to guru gobind singh indraprastha university recognized by bar council of india approved by all india council of technical education and nb ca accredited for mca program wips has earned an a grade by nac and is recognized by ugc under section 2f we have 12 courses and have collaborated with mhrd initiatives for quality education what you see today dr achna and dr samir uh, is basically two set of volunteers from the school the national social social service volunteers and the gender champions all of whom have placed society before self as i always give them a pat on their back i also feel privileged to have a brilliant faculty team uh, heading these societies ms tazi fatma who has very closely interacted with both of you dr sunil mishra and dr anshu gagal uh, all of whom have uh, really really helped us make this event possible by contacting both of you and you thank you so much both of you for enabling us to conduct this event uh, these students and you all are indeed a role model uh, for generations to come so uh, over to uh, you dr rachna if you had a word to say i think i kind of talked you in between yeah thank you so much for inviting me it has been a wonderful association and uh, look forward to many for uh, such opportunities so i would like to leave uh, though i would have loved to uh, listen uh, dr samir's lecture but actually i have to rush for my evening opd and probably we have a recording and we can i can you know uh, have the pleasure of listening to it uh, sure, sure definitely ma'am so good day and goodbye thank you so yeah, thank you so much ma'am thank you so much Rachna, ma'am, can you stay for a minute? Yeah, yeah. Hello, how are you? I'm good. So, hi everybody. Uh, Sabir Badlani. Um, so, pleasure being here. I got to catch the last five minutes. I just posted the risk factors for uh, male breast cancer on the chat. So, if anybody is interested, before we get started, uh, I don't know how many of you know that uh, Shilpa, Rachna, and I went to the same school. and for the record both of them used to trouble me a lot i was a very shy boy and i used to get uh, hazed by both of them so today is a little bit of a payback time that i'm going to take advantage of <laughs> you're most welcome sameer rachna please carry on <laughs> okay uh, so um rachna was the smart one i was always like number 3 or number 4 so for the record rachna was the topper in our class Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for the you know uh, introduction. <laughs> I'm going to tell more stuff. You might want to stick around, Rachna. So I have a I have a whole list of stuff about you that I've written up. Don't open this up here. And we are yes, getting a proper introduction. 
but you know it's uh, good to see both of you shilpa and samir it's good to we could connect you know with this uh, noble cause of uh, yeah. you know spreading yeah absolutely Thanks to that's the uh, most important thing yeah 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 So, so Samir, I think you should continue with the lecture, and I would love to, uh, you know, listen and laugh, uh, you know, yeah, because uh, you have an amazing sense of humor, and uh, so uh, I have to leave for my evening opity, and I'll yeah, catch. Yeah. Of course. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Bye. Yeah. Take bye. care. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Shilpa. So, uh, Doctor Samir, resist. yeah, yeah, please, Doctor Samir Badlani received his uh, Doctor of Medicine degree from the University of Delhi. and completed his internal medical residency from university of oklahoma he also received training in biomedical informatics wherein biomedical data is used for problem solving and decision making motivated by efforts to improve human health currently dr badlani is heading the fairview health services at minneapolis which is a nonprofit academic health system his experience as a clinician and it executive enables him to provide and consistently improve upon the safe high quality and efficient clinical care operations and delivery on behalf of the institute and my team i uh, extend a very warm welcome to you and wow that's beautiful so that's samir's morning today thank so, you thank you dear students over to you dr samir please Thank you, Shilpa. Uh, thank you, Tazib, for this opportunity, uh, and thanks to all of you for spending some time uh, listening to me uh, as I share my thoughts. So, uh, as Shilpa said, you know, I got my med school degree from uh, Delhi University, uh, and I worked at Ames for a couple of years, and then went to the U.S. and got a informatics fellowship <clears throat> from the University of Utah. Uh, did my internal medicine residency. which in many ways is equal to the md here at university of oklahoma and became faculty at university of chicago for about a decade where i taught at the med school and the residency program and my clinical practice was mostly solid organ tumors and transplant medicine in the inpatient side i uh, did not have an opd uh, as many doctors do subsequently i moved on to more corporate roles uh, in healthcare and became the chief medical information officer think of it like the use of technology and data analytics in healthcare delivery um, it's a fascinating field that i was very lucky to get exposed to 20 years ago and have uh, been able to build a career so it's been a lot of fun and uh, shilpa is very kind to say that i run fairview health system my boss wouldn't be happy to hear that i'm still number 2 Uh, which is just fine uh, it gives me a lot of time to do things that i enjoy doing like uh, spending time with uh, people on calls like this and sharing my thoughts my role is right now the chief digital information officer and uh, roughly translates into uh, i have areas like enterprise marketing uh, core it data analytics medical informatics and digital transformation of healthcare in my portfolio and uh, I don't practice actively uh, in the sense uh, I still have a medical license, but what has happened through social media channels like WhatsApp and others, uh, I have the benefit of helping friends, family, their friends and family. So now, when somebody says, "Do you practice?" I say, "Yeah, I have a global virtual concierge medical practice. Uh, I don't charge anything for it except." Uh, you know good wishes and goodwill occasionally i get a nice bottle of japanese scotch which i never say no to so uh, it works out for me uh, all right so uh, the topic that uh, tazib and uh, shilpa asked me to speak to uh, since you've already had uh, an expert like rachna speak about breast cancer per se therapy and risk factors is more around the patient the psychological effects and what does a patient go through uh, i can tell you that you know uh, one of the other things that i forgot to add in my uh, biography is that when i was at aims i used to work at their cancer hospital under dr kochu pillai in the uh, 2000 so that was a wonderful experience as well and i got to you know uh, have the honor of uh, participating in the care of many patients um, so let me start you know the way i have divided up my thoughts is i'm going to speak about the patient first the primary caregiver and the extended family um the interesting thing about cancer and i'm also going to keep giving you books and websites to look and read if you are so interested so the most famous book on cancer right now is the emperor of maladies 
Uh, it's a quite a thick book, uh, but I highly recommend you read it. It's by a American author of Indian origin, and uh, you will get a real good sense about cancer. Um, what I found about cancer, uh, not just in India and US, the two uh, countries that I've had to practice medicine, there is a lot of uh, myth about it. There is a lot of uh, you know perceptions about it. And when somebody gets a diagnosis of cancer or you want to talk about cancer, I don't know if you guys have experienced this in your dealings, uh, everybody just goes quiet and uh, nobody wants to have a conversation. There is this, you know, uh, uh, just almost like a panic attack uh, falls over the entire conversation, you know, and people feel like, uh, you know, it's a topic that they just don't know how to react to is my best way to uh, describe it. And I found that very interesting uh, observing it. Now, when a patient suspects or gets uh, cancer, uh, often what happens is that uh, people just assume it's an automatic death sentence. And, uh, you know, your life is over and there is nothing else that's going to, you know, uh, be available to you or you pretty much should, you know, hang up everything and uh, go to Banaras and find a little kutia there or something like that. That's literally the level of, uh, you know, reaction that I see in the Indian society, uh, which is very unfortunate. Uh, the good thing is there are many, many cancers now that uh, get, get completely treated. Uh, you know, there are cancers that have very little treatment and yes, truly are, you know, you get a clock uh, against your name and you're running down that clock. And in the middle, there are many cancers that, you know, have different uh, ebbs and flows. And it really depends on, you know, what stage and what kind of variety there is. So, you know, if you stick to breast cancer, there are many breast cancers that are completely curable. Uh, especially the ones that have the right kind of hormone profile. So estrogen positive, uh, progesterone negative, and Herceptin positive. If you have something like that and it's got caught at a lump stage, then a very simple surgery called lumpectomy, uh, chemotherapy, some chemotherapy and radiation, really you ha can have a hundred, you know, uh, person survival rate in many of these cases. On the flip side, you know, uh, I don't know if uh, Shilpa and Rachna shared with you guys, uh, we lost a classmate by the name of Jasleen a couple of years ago, who unfortunately had a uh, new cancer diagnosis with undifferentiated tissue. And it just, you know, within six months uh, took over her life. And unfortunately she passed away. So that's an example of, you know, where, you know, there is no therapy yet right now, but a lot of research being done, a lot of uh, opportunities are there. So, uh, what I like to tell people is once you get a diagnosis of cancer, let's first take a pause and understand what exactly it is, what size it is, where is it, and how can we figure out how to treat it. The reason I find the reaction of people to cancer uh, very intriguing, and just not the patient, but the family and everybody else, is there are so many diagnoses uh, in healthcare that have very similar lifespan limitations. So if you have congestive heart failure, stage three, then you have about three to five years to live. If you have really bad COPD, not asthma, this is different, uh, uh, where you know, somebody has been a smoker all their life and uh, you know, now the lungs are completely uh, full of emphysema, you probably have another three to four years to live if that, and then you also have to be on oxygen. That's again, you know, uh, three to five years of lifespan or something like that, or if you have kidney failure or any, you know, diseases that uh, I had to see and other people see. But it's cancer that somehow brings out this uh, complex human emotion that I think is very interesting and worth talking about a little bit. So the first thing that a cancer patient experiences is absolute denial in general, that this is not happening, uh, there must be something wrong. And uh, uh, I would recommend, you know, uh, there is a professor by the name of Bridges. He was a change management professor that some of you may have read, nothing to do with medicine in this case. But the Bridges theory of uh, transitions uh, is an interesting concept where what he talks about or did talk about many years ago is that when you get a bad news, everybody goes through, you know, four or five stages of uh, change. And Kubler-Ross is another example of the five stages of grief as they talk about it. So if anybody's interested, not just for this particular case, but anything else uh, in life, uh, it's important to look at those stages. And they're all similar, but basically what they start with is the first is denial. 
you actually just don't want to accept that you know anything like this could be happening uh you know uh, in my case i started losing my hair at the age of 18 and probably only three years ago i finally admitted to myself i don't have much hair left uh, so perfect example of a human being can you know convince yourself of almost anything um and <clears throat> so similarly, you know, a cancer patient will go through a lot of denial. This is not happening. So in India, we have doctor shopping. We will go to 15 doctors and it's not just in cancer. It's for your skin affliction. It's for your diabetes. You will go to 15 other people till you find the answer you're looking for. You know, I see that in diabetes a lot. Till you find a doctor who says, no, no, you don't need medicines. I can cure this with Ayurveda or homeopathy or like, he's a good one. Uh, and now, th and then you try to go to your family and push that doctor on all your friends. Also, that's also like a social responsibility we Indians have. Is mere ko acha mila to dusre ko bhi dunga You know, uh, so uh, so the, you go through the denial phase, and uh, then you really get into anger. And I think we should spend a few minutes talking about the anger phase of a cancer patient's journey. Uh, the anger goes into two parts. Uh, what did I do wrong? that this is happening to me. So you start going through your life history and the challenge is in most cancers, uh, we just can't point out you did X thing wrong. So like in heart attack or diabetes, I can generally say that, look, you are obese, you didn't exercise, your diet is too carb rich, uh, you know, uh, you drink too much alcohol. All these things add up and uh, is an example of, you know, this probably added to your risk factors, Car you know, cardiovascular disease. If you look up the Framingham score um, online, you can put in your age, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and it'll give you a sense of what your 10 year risk is. It will show, you know, 5%, 10% and so on and on. But in cancer, many cancers, we can actually pinpoint what went wrong. In some cancers, we can't. There are you know, chemical exposures, radiation exposures, uh, high alcohol intake, uh, you can say. But in breast cancer, it's multifactorial. Now, interestingly, there are some uh, you know, groups of human beings, especially the Ashkenazi Jews in the United States. So it's a group of Jews who migrated and stuck, stay with each other and come from a very specific part of Eastern Europe. We find they have an amazingly high rate of breast cancer. So there the scientists were able to do some genome sequencing and they found uh, that there are genome uh, sequ groups called BRCA1 and BRCA2, BRCA1 and 2. So if people have those two both gene compounds in them, then they have tremendously high risk. So yes, in that case, you know, uh, in the most extreme cases, you do, uh, uh, you know, you remove the breast tissues and the ovaries both uh, in a way to reduce the hormone exposure in the body and you can do it, uh, you know, then, I think most of you may have heard of the HPV vaccine that has become available over the last five, six years to be given to women and in some cases boys as well uh, in their early teens that uh, reduces the risk of uh, certain kinds of uh, squamous cell cancers later on. So in few cases you can, but in most cases you can't. And, you know, uh, I find interesting, uh, you know, uh, conversations with patients who say, you know what, I ate something three years ago on a trip to XYZ place. And, you know, ever since that day, I haven't felt well. They try to find that pinpoint, that event in their life and say that this is what happened. And, you know, what I realized is I try not to argue back too much. I just try to not say, no, you are wrong. I don't say that. What I say is, well, let me tell you what science tells me and what I know about the risk of breast cancer and other uh, such situations. Because no matter how much facts I put in front of somebody, they're still going to hold on to what allows them to rationalize what's happening with them. And that's what we have to understand. You know, we are not going through it. They are going through it, number one. And you just have to give them time, space uh, to get through it. But we have to make sure we don't reinforce any of the things that cause a person to start thinking like that or believing like that. So, uh, you know, my own mother uh, is a breast cancer survivor and her diagnosis happened in, you know, 2008, I want to say. And it was interesting. She had a lump uh, in her thirties, which she immediately went for testing. And, uh, you know, uh, it was taken out. It was just, you know, a fibrotic cyst and nothing to do there. So when she got a lump again, in her mind, she did two things, which I will tell you is an example of what most patients do is to say, well, I had this before the lump, so it must not be cancer. Or they will say that, you know, I'm just going to pray harder. So, uh, you know, this whole thing of that, I can pray things away 
or that there will be a miracle uh, for me because I'm just such a good uh, human being, uh, you know, whether you're a good Muslim, Hindu, Christian, whatever you want to pick, somehow that's going to give me extra thing. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't happen. So I'm sorry to disappoint those of you who were hoping for that answer. Uh, so uh, she delayed it and she waited nine months and the cancer that was probably this small became the size of my fist. So uh, what that did was that delayed diagnosis caused the cancer to spread. And instead of being a very simple lump surgery, like I told you about, she had to go through a big surgery and a lot more radiation, a lot more chemotherapy that was more suffering for her uh, at the end of the day. And my father as the primary caregiver. And if you look at the tables that talk about survival rates, so most cancer uh, rates, uh, if you look at the survival rates, they're either broken down into a three-year survival rate if it is a very aggressive type of cancer, or it will be in the five to seven-year survival rate. So in her case, she went from 100% to 65% survival rate. So what that means is if there were 100 patients like her uh, who had locally advanced disease, which is what her diagnosis became, uh, only 65 of them would survive. So she's one of the lucky ones that, you know, she still survived, but at a tremendous cost to her own health, uh, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Uh, and she was very lucky that she had her septin uh, hormone positive. So just in the last 10, 15 years, a new chemotherapy drug called Herceptin has been become available. And if you are Herceptin positive, it's a directed therapy rather than sort of a broad-based therapy and you know you get lucky so this thing of denial when you first see the symptoms uh you know goes two ways some people will run to the doctor you know every 15 days and say i have this you know they start showing things to you uh chilpa and i have another classmate i won't take the gentleman's name who uh, literally every 15 days thinks something is wrong uh, with him so whether it's his heart or his liver or something uh you know we jokingly call him chintamani and you know that's uh you know, more high school stuff. But the reality is the human psychology can be anything. You can have people who are in complete denial, people who are sort of in the middle and do the right thing generally, and people who are very hypochondriac. Nonetheless, you know, uh, cancer is something that we should get screening on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, there is a website called knowyourlemons.org. Uh, I will post it on uh, the chat uh, momentarily when we are in the question stage and I can... Uh, Stop talking for a bit, uh, which you guys should look at. It's a very uh, impressive campaign that is now a global campaign that educates people about, you know, how to do self-examination of breast and different kinds of breast tissue and, you know, what is high risk of cancer and what is not high risk of cancer. And that's the best thing that a woman can do is do uh, self-examination. I would encourage men to also look at it because male breast cancer, you know, is... Uh, uh, uncommon, but not that uncommon. Uh, everybody has breast tissue, uh, whether you're fat, thin, whatever. You may have a small, you may have slightly big. And as I posted on the chat, the risk factors are mostly around, uh, you know, uh, age, alcohol use, and, uh, you know, uh, radiation exposure, and anything that causes hormonal imbalance. So in some cases, it could be hormonal therapy. In some cases, you drink so much alcohol that your liver is messed up, and so on and on. Uh, anyhow, so I think helping a patient get through the denial uh, phase is very important because after denial comes anger. Uh, you start lashing out at everybody in front of you and you feel like life has been unfair to you. And I've seen it in a lot of my patients. I've seen it in my family. I've seen it in my extended family. They look at any bad events, you know, that may have happened. You know, you hear things like, uh, oh, uh, I never had happiness in my life. So this happened. Or, uh, well, if you're in India, my mother-in-law was very mean to me, so that's why I carry, you know, pain in my heart, and this is why it happened. Or, you know, in my case, my mother said, you went to America, you're a bad son, and that's why I got it. So, you know, as much as it hurts to hear those things from your own parent, you have to realize they're in a very tough place <clears throat> right now, and they don't really mean those things. Uh, you know, but, and it's not that I was able to brush it away. It, take, it took me a few months to not stop thinking about that. So you just have to understand, you know, um, the patient is going through a lot. So the, uh, you know, the fear and the denial thing are real. They will come and go. And the fear comes from, you know, two places. One, am I going to die? Well, let me tell you guys something you may not have heard. We're all going to die. Uh, that's just the real. The day we are born, the only reality and guarantee in our life is we're all going to die. There's no reason to be morose about it. 
you know, Bhutan is a very interesting culture. I suggest you guys read about it. Uh, and uh, they, in their culture, talk about death every day. Uh, so they talk about that, okay, if I die, how will things work? If I die, you know, I wish for this or that. So when you talk about death in a matter of fact, as something that's an inevitability, you know, um, it becomes easier. Uh, the fear is less, you deal with it on a daily basis. You know, uh, somebody may be completely healthy, uh, but, uh, and you know, the neighbor might have some really bad cancer, but the person who's healthy may have an accident tomorrow. But the person who was had cancer just kept thinking all day long, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Every You view the life from the lens of I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Well, you're shortchanging yourself uh, and everybody around you. So the, you know, the fear uh, comes from fear of death and then the fear of recurrence. Uh, you know, uh, patients who are on the remission side, you know, obviously get checked up and then they worry about just, you know, um, is it going to come back? So it brings out a lot of emotions. Um, the next uh, sort of complex of uh, emotions are, or experiences are pain and fatigue. Cancer patients definitely experience a lot more pain uh, than the average human being. This is real. They experience a lot more fatigue uh, than, uh, you know, what you and I can imagine about. And think of the day where you were totally tired, you just did not do anything, but somehow everything, you know, uh, whatever happened, you were really fatigued. Now multiply that by 5x, that's how these patients feel almost on a daily basis, especially during the chemotherapy phase. So, you know, things like uh, saying, buck up, just let's do it, uh, may be good one or two times, but you have to understand, you know, they're really pushing themselves and it's good to push themselves. So uh, really trying to understand, uh, you know, uh, how do you talk about understand pain and fatigue and really understand that for a cancer patient, it's non-trivial. And our goal is to support uh, that particular uh, complex. Uh, the third thing that, you know, when patients get through the initial anger and denial phase and have are in the acceptance phase, there's another interesting emotion that you may have seen that comes guilt. Uh, which is, you know, can come from that, oh, what did I do wrong? Uh, now it's not the world didn't do anything wrong. I did something wrong. Or, you know, I should have, you know, drank more hot water with lemon in the morning, whatever your family's favorite, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, hype is in, uh, you know, ginger water, that water. And, uh, or I should have not, you know, uh, done this. Uh, or maybe I'm a sinner. You know, that's the other thing that in our Indian ecosystem and many other ecosystem, um, you know, comes in where uh, we think that this is a function of my bad deeds in this life. Or I love the fact that we still talk about previous life uh, as if, you know, it's a guaranteed thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, that somehow has caused me to get cancer, you know. I'm not learned enough to argue against that or for that, but what I will tell you is that it's an unhealthy thing to think about that somehow I gave this to myself. Yeah, if you were smoking a lot, if you were you know, really obese and you messed up your liver and that led to some disease or cancer, sure, you did it to yourself in some ways, uh, but it's not that straightforward. Uh, nobody likes to do anything like this. And uh, you know, so the guilt and the blame complex go together. You try to, you know, feel it, blame yourself, blame your family, blame your friends. And it sort of, uh, it's an interesting emotion because the people feel that, uh, I don't know, it gives them something to hang on to, uh, something to focus their emotions on because focusing on, I have to now go through six rounds of chemotherapy. You know, it will be a lot of struggle and challenges. Those are uh, difficult emotions for somebody to go to. The next one I'll speak about is social issues. And for me, I find that very challenging. You know, it's one thing for the patient to go through what they're going and go through that emotion. There's a little bit of justification I feel, you know, I can extend to them. But we as a society, I'll just tell you, do a piss poor job of supporting our patients and family members with cancer. It's almost like we think I did something right, you did something wrong. That's why you have cancer. I'm a vegetarian, uh, you know, this guy's a non-vegetarian. Um, I don't drink alcohol, you drink alcohol. Uh, I pray to the right God, you pray to the wrong God. You know, literally, you know, we laugh about these things, but trust me, uh, in our own families, there are people who think like that. Uh, you know, these days, obviously, I won't get COVID because I do pranayam in the morning and I have high immunity, so good luck. Uh, 
really, you know, they go through these kinds of things. Uh, so our goal as the uh, social circle of people who may have cancer is to be supportive and is to listen. Uh, it's the role of the doctor and the care team to provide medical advice. Our goal is to listen, to understand, versus listen, to respond. Uh, so I'll say it again, listen, to understand, versus listen, to respond. And I find that, you know, when people say, oh, I had a really rough day, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I just want to lie down. They're like, no, 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 uh, you know, uh, here, I got this special, you know, dish that I cooked for you, and it helped my mama G 10 years ago, so it's definitely going to help you or something like that. So you, you know, uh, you get all those, and you're all trying to help. It's coming from a good place, but it's very misplaced. That's the challenge. You know, someday the patient might just want to be alone, you know, read a book and go for a walk or, you know, just think, stop and think. Um, and uh, we just don't give them that space. We feel that if I leave them alone, I'm doing them a disservice. Uh, so, you know, really learning to say, what does this person want? and uh, not trying to course correct that person to what we think our values are. Uh, I'll give you an example. I have had patients who are 76, 78 years old with terminal cancer, and the daughter came to me and said, uh, I'm just so flabbergasted. I said, what happened? Uh, she said, my dad still wants to smoke, uh, and he has lung cancer. I said, okay, so what's the problem? Uh, she said, but this is what gave him the cancer. I said, yeah, but he's not getting better, right? Uh, you do know that. So if the dude wants to smoke for the last 16 weeks of life, I'll buy him a cigarette packet. You know, uh, what's the problem here? You know, so it's, it, it, life is not a punishment. Uh, you know, I, I remember, you know, I had the privilege of helping my wife's grandmother in her last few days. Uh, she didn't have any particular disease except diabetes and all that. And as, you know, she was coming towards the end, her blood sugar started dropping and we took her off almost every diabetic medicine. And then I get a frantic call. She wants to eat ice cream. I'm like, she's 86 years old. She wants to eat ice cream all day. Give her ice cream all day. What, what are you trying to do to her? You know, so let's keep life in perspective here. You know, for a 46-year-old with bad diabetes to eat ice cream, yes, I'll get on the phone and chew them out. But, you know, an 89-year-old just wanting to have ice cream, uh, even if, you know, it's bad for them, why do you want to talk about it? So really uh, think of a cancer person's uh, journey as from a quality of life perspective. So when we say, okay, you have these treatments that can be given to you, what I try to tell anybody is you as a patient, have the right to decide, do you want to go through this or not? So if a patient who has a curable cancer says, no, I don't want to go through the pain, the radiation, the surgery that comes with this, and I will just deal with whatever comes my way, as long as they are of sound mind and have thought this through, it is our responsibility as caregivers and family members to respect that. And what I find very challenging in India is half of the time we don't even tell the patient uh, and this is not something that happened 20 years ago when I used to still live in India. This is, I'm talking about six months ago when uh, another classmate of ours, sorry, we have very interesting classmates. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the mother-in-law has cancer. I'm like, have you told uh, Amma about it? They're like, no, we're going to tell her in a month. So the person who has cancer doesn't know. Everybody in the family knows the person has cancer. I am somebody she's never met in her life living like 3,000 miles away. I know she has cancer. So in uh, at least the U.S. way of thinking, that is actually uh, a violation of a patient's privacy and rights. Uh, I personally think whatever you may think that your father or your mother is incapable of handling the truth, that's not your place to decide that. The patient has to be told everything before anybody else knows. Uh, we actually see this in Hispanic culture as well, uh, especially for the mother of the family. They will not tell the mother the bad thing the son or the daughter uh, will want to know. And because there is a language barrier in many cases of uh, the mother only knowing Spanish, uh, you know, having recently migrated, the English speaking person will hold all the information. And I've had situations where I'm standing in the room. I'm like, no, tell it to them. I know enough words of Spanish to know whether you told the truth to that person or not. And just getting the family to tell the person the truth. They deserve to know the truth. Uh, it is they who are going through it the rest of us are not going through it. So that's, uh, you know, some of the challenges that we speak about. Uh, and then the social stigma. Uh, I think it's important to talk about that as well. Breast cancer is interesting in the sense that uh, a lot of uh, patients lose their hair. 
uh, as you know, uh, through the chemotherapy. Now, you know, there are better, uh, well, not better, but different drugs uh, that have much uh, reduced risk of hair loss. Um, and, uh, you know, there are hospitals, at least I know of many here, I don't know how many of the, how much of that happens in India, where they proactively will, you know, set you up with a wig before you start a chemotherapy. Uh, imagine having to go look for a wig uh, when you're already going through chemotherapy and throwing up and losing your hair. So uh, this is something here we do before you go through chemotherapy and get a wig. Uh, you know, if you're getting surgery where breast tissue is being removed, then they already set you up with uh, a bra that has padding on one side or set you up with a plastic surgeon once you are cancer-free, should you desire that. So all those things that uh, you and I may think are trivial, that why would you care about these outwardly appearances when you, know, you are now surviving from cancer? That's you know, fallacy. Human beings by definition are vain, whether we want to accept it or not. And uh, the way our mind is that how we look to ourselves has a very important uh, input to us. So why, would, why do we wear nice clothes? So why do we comb our hair or if you have hair? Uh, why do we, you know, uh, do many of these other things. It's a very basic human need. So for us as family members to think, I can't believe my mother is worried about her hair when she has cancer uh, is uh, you know, outright not okay. So taking care of those things uh, you know, can really help a patient. There are some chemotherapies where you can put ice packs on the head to reduce the blood supply to the hair so that you know, the cancer drug doesn't come there uh, during the infusion. So many things you can do to help a patient feel uh, a higher level of self-esteem and feel better uh, so that they can take care of themselves. Uh, now, the social stigma side of it is you see somebody with cancer, what do you do? If I was in a classroom, I would have you know, called on all the back benchers and uh, asked them to give an example, but we can't do that today. So we turn our eyes away. That's what we do. We look here and we look there. Uh, we try to make obvious small conversation on nonsensical topics why uh, talk normally uh, treat them as a human being uh, you know don't bring up their cancer every time but if they want to talk about their cancer look them in their eyes and have a conversation about it that's what you know you can do uh, you know celebrate their birthdays celebrate your birthdays uh, celebrate occasions yeah you don't have to go nuts but you don't uh, you know it's not a death sentence for every day for the rest of they're still alive right now uh, so let's, you know, treat them uh, that way. So that, you know, talks a lot about uh, the patient. Then I'll go into something that I think is often missing to a very big degree in Indian culture is the primary caregiver. So in my mother's case, it's my father uh, who's a primary caregiver. And, you know, in somebody else's cases, it might be the parent, it might be the spouse, it might be one of the child, but there's always one primary caregiver. And uh, studies have shown really detailed sociological studies that the emotion complex that a cancer patient goes through, the primary caregiver goes through almost the same level of it. So the depression, the anxiety, the fear, everything, you're almost parallel to it because you're living with that person, you're dealing with it every day. And... Um, you know, in our culture, it's like, well, I'm the husband, it's my job. You know, uh, she would have done it for me, or it's my father, he took care of me, now it's my turn to take care of them. So you just, you know, keep going through all of this. Uh, now, that's great that we are willing to be that supportive, but, you know, on the flight, what does a hostess say? Put the oxygen on yourself first before somebody else, right? So never has that been more true than a situation like this. And I can tell you as many times I've had a conversation with my father that, hey, can you take a break? Uh, you know, what do you do for yourself? And he looks at me as if like, I thought you were an intelligent son. What kind of a stupid question is that? You know, uh, so, you know, just the concept that the primary caregiver needs a break, the primary caregiver need, can feel all these things uh, is just like, when you talk about it, it's like you're almost, uh, you know, uh, engaging in blasphemy, uh, that's what you are doing when it comes around. So uh, that can cause the primary caregiver to go through their own set of uh, psychosocial, emotional, uh, physical diseases. Uh, stress is definitely known to be a risk factor in cardiovascular disease for sure. 
and uh, you will see that uh, play out in many cases uh, their own mood swings uh, their own uh, you know unhappiness quotient uh, all of those things will light up uh, so the first thing is that as if you're a primary caregiver of a cancer patient, acknowledge that you are the primary caregiver of that uh, you know, cancer patient. Uh, reach out to family and friends to help. Uh, make the cancer patient understand slowly over time, not on day one, that you, know, you will need to take breaks and there is nothing wrong with that. And it will be better for them you know, that uh, if you take breaks, because when you are taking breaks and self-healing and you come back, you will be a better caregiver to that person. And, you know, I see this in so many cases where that relationship becomes a very pathological codependency relationship. I have to take care of X. X is like, you have to take care of me. And like, you forget that the person in front of you is a human being and also gets tired and other things. Uh, and these are not easy things to talk about. So none of what I'm talking about today is like a 30 minute conversation with uh, known to who has cancer these are things you do so you know simple things like if x person is the primary caregiver then you know you just show up one day and say hey uh, dad why don't you go uh, for a walk or with your friends i'll just hang out with uh, you know mom for the next four hours and you just like, send him out of the house now i've never been able to do that except for 15 minutes but you know uh, you have to try if you know uh, you reach out to friends, you reach out to family and you spend more time and allow that other person to take a complete break and do what they want to do. Uh, so really understanding the fatigue that comes with uh, being a primary caregiver, it can go on for years. Uh, you know, it's a non-trivial amount of uh, effort and emotional pull that you are putting. A lot of these things create financial stress. So, you know, what we don't realize is going through a cancer diagnosis, um, you know, often causes people to drop out of their employment uh, or go into, you know, partial employment. Uh, so many other things that, you know, uh, start getting in the way uh, that you have to think about. Um, so I know I've been speaking a lot. I will just very quickly uh, share a few resources. So one of the things to understand is when you get a cancer diagnosis, besides this emotional thing, uh, I feel the information gap is just insane. You know, uh, whether it's India or US, you go to your doctor, you get good 15, 30 minutes, if that, and they're focused on that point of your care at that point. You have 27 questions, you know, uh, why, how, where, what's next? Uh, I had, you know, this pain here, what about that? Or, you know, is my family at risk and those kinds. So unfortunately, uh, you know, our healthcare systems uh, are not designed to respond to that need. And if you do a survey of cancer patients and their families, you will find that is shown to be one of the most uh, big, the biggest frustration that they talk about is the information gap. So, you know, there's a website called uh, breastcancer.org uh, that you guys should look up. Uh, and in US, there was a startup. Uh, well, we call it a startup, but what it was was you know, realizing that you go through all this without much information. And if you're the only one that has, you know, breast cancer in the extended family, then no matter how nice the other people are, they just don't really, really understand what you're going through and what your needs are. I mean, as much as you try, that's the reality. Um, so there is a website called Patients Like Me. Now, unfortunately, over time, it's become a little commercialized and has become sort of a, you know, way to catch data from patients and monetize it. But still, you know, communities, uh, online communities like Patients Like Me is uh, a wonderful resource uh, where you can literally go and say, I have this kind of irritable bowel disease, this variant. And suddenly you realize there are 50 patients, uh, you know, uh, like me and uh, that allows you to talk in context and it's very powerful. So, you know, uh, what I found, uh, you know, really troubling, deeply emotionally troubling is when our friend Jesseline passed away and, you know, I was visiting from US and I went to visit her. I saw the isolation she was going through, even though she was living in a joint family of people just didn't understand what it is to be her right now. Uh, and, 
you know, very simple thing. She pulled me aside. She always was a very conservative girl. Every time I would put a double meaning joke on the group, I would get a scolding from her. So, you know, she pulled me aside and she said, Samir, I need to ask you something. And I'm like, yes, what? She said, uh, I really need to get a proper padded bra. I said, okay, so we'll get you one. What's the big deal here? And I realized that it was something she felt uncomfortable talking about in front of her own husband, her own mother-in-law and family. And I said, did you not tell them? They're like, yeah, but they don't understand. And to me, that was heartbreaking that, uh, you know, forget chemotherapy and everything like that. Something as small as what she needed for her comfort. She had just gotten surgery uh, that was so difficult for her to bring up. And, you know, in that moment, almost everything that I have written up today to speak to you gets captured. You know, the isolation, the depression, the anxiety. So, uh, that's what we have to really think about. And, you know, who else would understand what she's going through? Another patient who has breast cancer. They'll be like, yeah, I got this. I can help you figure it out. So, you know, we helped her. But uh, to feel that people don't understand what I'm going through and I have to ask is not a nice situation to be in uh, in any means. So those are things that we have to think about. A lot of patients who go through cancer therapy have trouble doing activity of daily living. So that's a term we use here, ADLs, which basically you can think of as self-care. You know, being able to bathe yourself, use the restroom, clean yourself, shave if you are a guy. Um, well, that's why I keep a beard. <clears throat> I don't have to shave every day. It's the best thing I ever did. Um, so, you know, it's uh, those are things that uh, you have specialized physical therapy. And I know now in India, you can get good physical therapy, but 20 years ago, it was like, you know, you better have had a spine accident that you would probably get access to that. So those kinds of things, you know, really help. Nutrition. Uh, unfortunately, our uh, notions about nutrition are very misplaced, you know, uh, that, you know, non-veg food is bad, vegetarian food is good. It's nothing like that. Within non-vegetarian food and vegetarian food, there are good foods and bad foods. Uh, eat a potato every day and you pretty much are killing yourself you know I, I often tell my friends and they don't like hearing it that eating rice and potatoes you might as well eat a gulab jamun you'll get more emotional happiness and save amount of sugar in your body so uh, those are kinds of things that you know they have to talk about so then personal image we spoke about you know uh, prosthetics uh, like padded bras or plastic surgery uh, scar removal hair uh, you know uh, when it's needed and I'll tell you, it's interesting. My mother's hair went away. And boy, that was the main thing she was upset about. You can make whatever judgments you want. Here's a lady who might die, uh, is worried about her hair. And I can tell you, all of us are like that. All of us. And now when I go back and see her, the first thing she says is, Mere baal kaise lag rahe hai? and I literally have to go, what? What did you just ask me? I thought she would ask me about her diabetes or, you know, uh, other things she's going through. She says, baal kaise lag rahe hai? Well, yeah. that's what, uh, you know, um, is important to her. Uh, the final thing I'll say is post-traumatic yeah. stress disorder. So I would read up on PTSD uh, as much as you can. Normally, we speak about it in cases of, you know, soldiers coming back from the war or people exposed to tremendous amount of physical, emotional or sexual abuse uh, at some point in their life. Uh, that's also real for breast cancer patients. Um, so for me to go back and now tell my mother, I can't believe you're talking about your hair. You're lucky to have survived cancer. That's me missing, uh, you know, the boat here. She has PTSD, hands down. So when we are willing to take a person for chemotherapy and radiation and physical therapy, why are we not willing them, uh, to take them for PTSD or other psychiatric uh, psychological issues uh, to a trained cognitive behavior therapist or a, um, you know, a psychologist who specializes in that. So I would say that as much time as you spend researching the oncologist, the surgeon for a loved one who goes through this, take the time to think about a behavioral therapist and other kinds of experts who can help, not just for the patient, maybe if you're the primary caregiver, uh, find a group of primary caregivers, people like you who are helping somebody with uh, a loved one with cancer. The support you can get from them, you can't get from even your best friend. Uh, because context in everything is important. So I'll stop there. Um, I know we're almost at the end of our time uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Stuti, yeah, you I'm can- I'm really grateful. Okay.
so, uh, before you open up uh, for questions and uh, just to kind of you know uh, tweak each one of you uh, you are you have always seen me as somebody who's, who's been all years to all of you my young boys and girls here um, i have also done something similar to what samir just said should not be done and i i really want to admit it here so my dad as you are aware was also suffering from multiple myeloma and uh, there have been occasions like i had never seen like any daughter seen that tiger falling so rapidly and i saw and i used to keep on bothering samir all the time and used to tell me you you'd let him chill you know so i also went on to that denial mode and uh, when the doctor told me that it it's just a matter of 3 weeks i do not know what psychological sink went inside me and it was like my daddy's strongest and i used to feel that of course it cannot happen to my dad you know and and i i i did not share it with him that it's a matter of 3 weeks i did not even share it with myself despite the fact that i had heard it so to all of you out there i i really want to tell you that when you speak about shilpa ma'am and and you think that big room big office she is as mini school as as possibly any one of us so dev, don't ever ever uh, you know as as samir has pushed me to tell you this that don't ever get into a denial mode and 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 let it be what it is i mean let the world feel what they want to feel about you but guys go ahead go ahead and ask your questions over to you omisha please yeah <laughs> you know before uh, as you guys ask your questions i'll tell you something i was watching a show recently and uh, you know what else will you do these days you can't you know fly off to spain and italy as i would do on vacation or come to india and uh, you know meet my parents and then go to all my favorite kebab places that's all i do when i come to india uh, i was watching this show about where a guy repaired an old violin and it, you know i hope to be able to do something like that uh, myself and uh, you know my daughter who's 7 years old was playing the piano and i thought to myself you know the day i'm dying i would want her to play the piano for me and the reason i'm sharing this with you guys is imagine i have cancer and my daughter doesn't tell me or my family doesn't tell me that i have 3 weeks left if you tell me i have 3 weeks left i'm going to have my daughter play the piano for me i'm going to eat all the kebabs i can till i start throwing up and i'm going to finish out all my japanese scotch i deserve that decision making in my life and so do you so you know we do things out of love and we do things in life as if it's some game you guys are still very young and i can tell you one of the challenges uh, you know i wish rachna was on the call uh, she was the smartest person in our class and i think she still works 18 hours a day and i still tell her why are you working 18 hours a day do you not have enough money i know that's not the case uh, but she just likes to work and the biggest thing i can leave all of you is take a step back and do what is important to you and i can guarantee i'll bet my best japanese bottle of scotch with all of you 99% of you don't even know what is important to you because you have been running after titles money and uh, whatever you think your parents society friends expect from you you don't know what is important to you it's taken me 20 years to figure out what's important to me and that will again change in 20 years so you deserve to give yourself a break now i understand that i'm very privileged you know uh, i'm very lucky uh, i'm not trying to be facetiously humble that you know oh this guy is a doctor so he's called no I am very lucky. When I got through med school, there were forty thousand people who applied in PMT. That I got a rank of one forty-four is luck, and I can actually scientifically prove that to you because that year chemistry was easy and physics was hard, and I was good at physics, so I got in. If I had given the exam one year before, I would have not even been in the first thousand because chemistry would have wiped me out. Luck. So uh, yes, you have to earn a living. You have to take care of your family. but at some point you have to pause and say i am running so fast i don't even know why i'm running anymore uh, i don't know you know are you stopping and smelling the roses literally so those are things that you really have to take a pause and say what what does smelling the roses mean to you in my case it actually means growing a rose so that's what i do it forces me to slow down and learn patience and succeed and fail uh and spend time with my uh, daughter i'm a late father uh so i you know hold on to that as much as i can so i would urge you guys you know uh 
I appreciate all this conversation and I hope you never get cancer, but, uh, and neither do your loved ones, but let's not wait to get cancer before we realize the value of life. Uh, that's the last thing I'll say. All right. Now Certainly I'll don't questions. want this conversation to end by the way, but yeah, moving forward, sir, your words were not just informative, but so, so emotionally enriching. Uh, moving to the questions. Uh, we have Kashish Gupta with us, who is saying that thanks a lot, sir. Absolutely loved how you bought into the conversation with the aspect of mental health and empathy. Uh, what would you say should the way be for someone who struggles with hypochondria and health anxiety? Any advice or input would help? You know, uh, that's a pretty long conversation. Uh, the short answer to that would be, first of all, to accept that you have hypochondria. Uh, I think if the person is not going to accept that, then you pretty much can't do anything. Um, uh, the second thing is to seek out uh, a therapist because most of these things come from some other deep-rooted emotion, insecurity. Uh, and in many cases, uh, that hypochondria comes from because that person actually has gone through a lot more uh, health issues than you and I may have. So, you know, our good friend Chintamani, I won't tell his real name, he does go through a lot of health issues. But what that has done to him is that it has created this psyche where he has to really worry about things. But now he worries about things that are just crazy. Every three days, he'll post uh, vaccine. Aya kya? Uh, you know, uh, I'm like, Bhai tu mask pen, yaar, vaccine ka kya karega tu? Uh, you know, so uh, that's the reality of it. So, you know, we can, the thing is to not trivialize it. Uh, it's not something you can meditate away or willpower away or, you know, pray to the right Baba or eat the right biscuit and it will go away uh, or wear the right, uh, you know, tabis or necklace or ring. I, I love the ring concept. What a business, uh, you know, so uh, none of those things help. It's acknowledgement. And then it's also uh, seeking out the root cause of it. And it could be emotional, psychological and actual really health issues. And uh, then just trying to, you know, work your way back from it. It's like the fear of heights. It's the fear of closed spaces. Uh, you know, it takes time and you will never get to uh, a level of normalcy, whatever normal means in this world. I've never figured out that concept as well. What is normal? Um, so uh, that's what, how I would answer that question. Thank you for your answer, sir. Moving forward, we have Divyam Sharma. And I think Dr. Badlan, you are the best person to answer this. Uh, he, he I am the best that, person, that I know. <laughs> he's asking that considering the privacy around healthcare data, how is data effectively used in healthcare industry without invading the privacy of patients? So I would recommend, a uh, good question, I would recommend you read the HIPAA laws, H-I-P-A-A in US, Health Information Privacy and Portability Act. Uh, it's an insane amount. If you're a law student, it's like the best reading for you. It's like uh, 90,000 pages of privacy laws. But the basic concept is that if there is a group of uh, elements within your data that I can use to identify this is Shilpa Katri, then uh, I cannot share it unless uh, there is a health reason or without her explicit permission. So in India, you know how on WhatsApp suddenly you will see that Sharma and Dean B block now has COVID. In USA, that would get you to jail. Uh, because you absolutely have no right to know Sharma auntie has COVID in B block. Uh, so, uh, or, you know, somebody will get a lab report of uh, some liver disease and literally everybody in the family will forward it to 20,000 people in India. Are, my mamaji's son has this. Does anybody know what this is? No, you can't do that. Uh, WhatsApp so, University works good here. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's an amazing invasion of privacy. So in U.S., the laws are a bit too onerous, but uh, when we do research or we look at, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, opportunity to work on this, uh, the idea actually is that we de-identify the data. So we remove the name, we remove other elements that can be identified. And if I am uh, working, so I'm a provider organization, uh, Fairview takes care of about a million patients a year, and my previous organization took care of 3 million patients a year. So if I'm giving a data set to, for any reason to somebody, they have to sign a business associate agreement and a data use agreement, which holds them uh, to tremendous degree of liability and indemnification uh, 
so that if they lose the data or misuse the data, I don't go to jail, they go to jail. And in US, the fines can go up to millions of dollars for such mistakes and actually can get you into jail. So I would recommend you read the HIPPA uh, Act. Thank you, sir. I'm sure Divyam will definitely comply to that. Now, moving forward, we have Shikha Shrishti, who's asking that how can the primary caregiver or extended family help in keeping the morale of the patient high? Moreover, since sometimes people with cancer suffer from extreme anxiety and depression. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. First of all, that anxiety and depression uh, need to be treated like its own disease set. You have to, and your oncologist, I can tell you, uh, you know, uh, Rachna and the previous speaker are not, I'll tell them this on their face. Most oncologists in India are absolutely useless in providing emotional support. You know, uh, just absolutely downright useless. Uh, I worked with some of them, uh, most of them. Uh, you And you shouldn't expect it out of them, uh, honestly, at the end of the day. They should be nicer. Uh, I will tell them that on their face, but uh, you still are looking for emotional support in the wrong place. So uh, really finding out, uh, you know, uh, a good therapist, uh, finding, you know, patients like me, other self-support groups for the primary caregiver and the patient, are meaningful uh, things one can do to help with their morale. Uh, you know, uh, the other things one can do at home is keeping a bright environment. So one of the interesting things my mother does is she closes all the curtains and the room is dark. I'm like, yeah, And my dad pulled me aside and said, uh, we bought new curtains. She wants to admire the pattern and then get, you know, adulation from everybody who comes in. Auntie G, lagaya curtain out there. Fine. You know, uh, my wife changes curtains. I don't even know they have been changed. And then I get into trouble that you don't notice anything like all men. So, uh, you know, those are small things that uh, you can do. Uh, celebrate, uh, you know, that's another concept I would say. Celebrate small things. In India, especially, we are so in tune to celebrating only big events and big things and other stuff like that. We forget life is about small things. Big things is not about it, you know. Um, so really, you know, spending time with them, uh, if they want to, you know, be in a bad mood and go through their 30 minutes of anxiety venting with you, let them do it. Uh, you know, what I try to do with my mother is I will listen to her and then I will try to resize her uh, mindset around what's uh, going well in her life. So I'll tell her things like, look, you know, of all the Masis, you're the only one not married to a jerk. Most of my masters are total assholes. So, you know, I'll tell that to her. I said, look, your sons are both, you know, uh, doing reasonably okay. They're not stuck at home and feeding off you. I said, look at, you have a new house. And I remember to, you know, say, look, you have new curtains, uh, you know, uh, and look, oh, that person is still not doing well and you are much better out of your cancer. So find the positive things in life. And I would encourage all of you to do it. We often focus on things that are wrong and not going well. And we absolutely forget what's going well and what's good in our life. So, you know, really think about what is going well in their life and keep reinforcing it, you know. Uh, so those are things that, uh, you know, uh, will really make a difference. I, I do apologize. I have to, my work day has started. We start quite early here, so I have to jump off. But this was an absolute pleasure and uh, my privilege to share my thoughts and ideas with all of you and happy to do it on another topic some other time as well. So thank you so much, Samir. I think uh, before the vote of thanks, as a part of vote of thanks, uh, Supreet, could we have your poetry? She had written a beautiful poetry, Samir. Just two more minutes, please. Oh, thank you. I'm honored. Certainly, ma'am. Uh, good evening, sir. Before evening. I start with my poetry, sir, I would really, really like to tell you that this is one of the most amazing webinars I've ever had on breast cancer or on any topic of awareness. And this poetry that I've written is also, um, it's, it's not that personal to me, but the cause is pretty personal to me. So I just, uh, I really want to thank GC and NSS and my nodal officers and Shilpa ma'am for this opportunity. And just please pay heed to this for a couple more minutes. Sure. Suspected early or diagnosed late. A battle with cancer is a battle with fate. With one in 28 women diagnosed in India, breast cancer is increasing at an alarming late alarming rate. In male breast, cancers case, breast cancer cases, 1% of all cases fall. 
from patients to oncologists, breast cancer is a nightmare to all. A toxic journey filled with excruciating pain. October is all about stopping it from rising again. Admiring the strength of the people that endured every bit. In fact, the, the word survivor hardly does justice to it. Furthermore, October is all about saving more lives, no matter of young boys or of elderly housewives. The pink October leaves behind an appeal for diligent care and urges people to be cautious because a society secure is a society aware. Thank you, sir. And thank you, ma'am. Thank you. That's wonderful poetry. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, you guys take care. Uh, wear your masks. They do work above your nose. Um, wash your hands. Don't touch your eyes and maintain distance. That's the only thing that's going to help with COVID. Uh, you know, um, uh, this, uh, you know, Ram Devka biscuit and uh, your favorite tabis and your favorite, uh, you know, pearl ring. None of those are going to work. I'm sorry uh, to break your bubble if that's what you think. Uh, just take care of yourself, do the right thing. And, uh, you know, this too shall pass. And uh, if you're stuck at home, enjoy time with your family. Uh, you may not get that time again. Uh, take care. Thank you, buddy. God bless. Take care. Thank you so Bye much, sir, for such an insightful session and for your time. Absolutely. My only regret is I didn't get to trouble Rachana. That's I enjoyed that tremendously. <laughs> we'll uh, do that Rachana. in the group. Take care. Yeah, <laughs> Rachana is a very serious person. So uh, it's my life goal to trouble her. But uh, all right. Take care, guys. Thank Bye -bye. you so much, sir. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Badlani for being here and helping us look at breast cancer from a social and psychological perspective. Uh, we are so grateful to have been granted this opportunity to conduct this webinar on breast cancer awareness. I extend our deepest gratitude towards the guest speakers who made time to raise awareness around and sensitizing about this issue. Dr. Vikas Talreja, Dr. Rachna Rutaki, uh, Dr. Samir Badlani, it was truly an honor to have you all with us today. I thank the audience for their interaction and participation and eagerness to learn more about the sensitive issue of breast cancer. I would like to extend my deep gratitude towards the management of WIPS who gave us this brilliant opportunity to raise awareness about such a significant uh, topic and provided us with all possible support to the successful conduct of this webinar. I am immensely thankful uh, to Professor Shilpa Khatri Babbar for being a constant support and providing her meaningful guidance throughout this campaign. Ma'am, this webinar and this campaign would not have been possible without you. I thank my colleagues, Dr. Sunil Mishra and Dr. Anshu Gagal for their help and support. And lastly, but not the least, I would like to thank uh, this brilliant team of NSS and Gender Champions Club uh, who work together day and night and make this uh, webinar possible. Thank you, dear students. Uh, much love. Thank you so much, ma'am. So Mom, with your I have, uh, I have uh, stopped the live stream, uh, screening and uh, thank you guys. It, it went off really well. Uh, and uh, whatever glitches, we work only before that. Uh, when event runs, that's the time when ownership is collective. Kisi se ek se kuch hai, uh, the other one picks up and uh, that's how it's always been like a family. But indeed, it went off very well. I mean, uh, I'm sure the, would Dr. Vikas also... Uh, have been in a position, uh, uh, it would have been like, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you say, a cherry on the cake, but it was a brilliant uh, thing. And uh, thank you all of you for working so late and, and especially to uh, Tezib, she's been like uh, there since morning and had to just grab a bite and that also a sandwich. So your kebabs are due, we'll go to Lucknow together and we'll do that. <laughs> so, uh, okay, God bless you guys. Uh, maybe take a leave. Now, yes, yes, yes thank, thank you so much, ma'am. God bless you. Take rest, Vita. Uh, report and recording 48 hours. So, Sunday night. Sorry. Sunday night, tak, please, because once we delay, it just goes off. And Supreet, that's my fault uh, only because when I saw. Uh, Dr. Vikas leaving and Dr. Rachna wanting to leave. So I knew this would happen. So therefore, I took the liberty of walking in Tehzeeb's vote of thanks and letting you in because I understand that she is uh, at a mature level and you worked for it. So that's why. So it's from Tehzeeb and me. Uh, thank you very much, Supreet. And apologies. thank you, ma'am. Right? And we love the poem, Supreet. Thank you for writing it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye, so Bacha. Good night. Take care. Take care. Thank you, ma'am.